Good morning and welcome, dear colleague and friend for the 50 meeting of International Pediatric Life Surgery Online Group. We are particularly satisfied as we have more than of 150 pre-registration for this event and more than 90 groups member. I would like to remind you that the International Pediatric Life Surgery Online Group does want to replace existing pediatric surgery association, but wants to be an integration to teaching by exploiting modern technological means. I would like to remind anyone interested that it is possible to enroll in International Pediatric Life Surgery Online Group by sending the enrollment application that you find on the website is www pediatriclivesurgery.it, a curriculum vitae and painting 50 years for year. Bank details, you can find them in the website. Registration entitles you the access to the meeting recording archive. Today we be connected with Graz, Austria, Madrid, Spain, Bologna, Italy, Leipzig, Germany, London, United Kingdom, New Delhi, India, Rockland, Poland, Pavia, Siena, and Varese in Italy. The session will be chaired by Juan Tovar, and the discussant will be Adrian Bianchi, Giovanna Ricci Petitoni, and Olga Tilt. Now let's start with the program. And please, President, if you want to start officially today. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. Uh, good morning, everybody friends and uh, the ones that I can see in my screen and, and, and some others that I see. We have already 50 people attending the meeting. The topic uh, today is very particularly interesting for pediatric surgeons, and that probably explains why we have so many people registered. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux is very frequent uh, during the pediatric uh, years, and uh, many issues remain unsolved. That's probably why we are so interested in this topic. It is associated to several comorbidities and some of some of them are going to be addressed in uh, the session today. And there are modalities in the treatment that will be approached as well by different um, surgeons in, the, in this session. So I uh, thank you very much for being here and I hope that you will enjoy this day that will be as a uh, previous session of uh, our group interesting for everybody and I hope that that will bring more and more people into our association. We can start when you are on Giovanna. Thank you. Good morning to everyone, to all the attendees of this uh, meeting and to all friends. I, I think we, we will start with the Bologna uh, Operative Theatre where uh, uh, where uh, me, uh, Madame Martelli and Ma uh, Madame Carlotta and Madame La Torfa will, will start uh, with uh, uh, their presentation. May may we? Be, um, sorry, I am a little confused this morning. <laughs> I will be better uh, going on due to my allergy. May we be connected with uh, the operative uh, room uh, in Bologna? So the program is a very full program and uh, the, the first presentation is related to the preparation of the operative table. Uh, then uh, we will have uh, the presentation from the anesthesiology and some uh, detail of life surgery. Then we will have a lot of contribution coming from uh, Leipzig, London, uh, New Delhi, Madrid, and uh, Giovanna, we are... okay. Giovanna, we are from the Paris. Okay, me? good morning. I think. Uh, the presentation of the preparation of the operative uh, table will be made by 
uh, not by uh, Madame Martelli, but by Carlotta Binaudo. Carlotta, are you there? Yeah, I'm, uh, can you okay. hear me? Okay, yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, Please, good morning. you can start. Good morning. No. My name is Carlotta and I am uh, the instrumentalist. I will show you the surgical instruments that I have prepared to perform today's surgery. This is a laparoscopic uh, gastric surgery for which I have prepared laparoscopic tools with a five millimeter diameter and 36 millimeter le length. With this type of surgery, it's also necessary to prepare the instruments for an eventual conversion to an open surgery. This type of surgery requires the use of four trockers, which you can see right here. Uh, the first one, this one, known as a pneumatic uh, trocker, has a 10 millimeter diameter and is used for the zero grade camera. This one. The remaining three trockers are uh, each one of uh, five millimeters and are used as uh, operative, operative trockers. One in particular is uh, used to hold the liver retractor, which is uh, this one. Okay. And uh, the other two remain for the laparoscopic tools. On the right part of uh, the display, I placed um, laparoscopic tools, which are from left to right, uh, two grasping forks, which are fenestrated with uh, automatic fine serration, two ready colson, which are uh, that for dissecting and uh, grasping forks, one Kelly dissecting and grasping forks, one uh, Babcock forks, which is this one. Then we have one Metzenbaum schister, blunt and curved, and one uh, thread cutting uh, schister. Then we have uh, a blunt dissector, yeah, uh, one uh, handle with uh, two way for both uh, suction and uh, irrigation. Then we have a micro hook, this one, which is for um, dissection with coagulation and uh, dissection unipolar electrode. Then we have uh, the reticulator, which is this one. Then we have the knot pusher, one uh, liver uh, retractor, two Lima needle holder. This one uh, are used uh, for grasp uh, surgical needles. In this case, uh, we're gonna use a 2-0 Etibon, which is this one, and um, which is a coated braided non-absorbable suture with a sky needle. Uh, last one, I show you the wall, um, the wall hanger, finishing for the laparoscopy section. On the central left of the display, we have uh, the forks to hold the sponge deep in, in the antiseptic, antiseptic solution for cleaning the skin. The knife handle with a surgical blade number 11 for the laparoscopic part and number 15 for the open. Uh, then we have the Dennis Brown forks, which is this one. Uh, surgical forks with uh, traumatic grip for skin and muscles, so which are this one. Uh, short and medium peeling forks, this one, are uh, a traumatic Forks used on delicate uh, tissues and for coagulation with the aid of the electro electrosurgical unit. Then we have short and medium anatomical forks for grasping the delicate tissues, such as bowels. Uh, surgical Edson forks with uh, very delicate, very delicate teeth at the tip, uh, which can be used to grab the viscera in the execution of the anastomosis. Then we have uh, anatomical Edson forks. Uh, here at the bottom left, uh, I place a series of uh, self-locking forks. In order, we have uh, 12 mosquitoes, eight pan, of which two are more pointed to facilitate the position of the drain tubes, two back up uh, forks, which are this one, uh, two are traumatic uh, rings for, so for delicate tissues, uh, such as uh, the intestine, two Bengalia forks, which are this one, two Crawford uh, hemostatic forks, a long and medium metal shaped forks, which are this one, eight uh, cocker curved uh, traumatic forks, this one, pointing uh, to the right, 
and the three curved uh, roster pen, uh, pen, which are this one. Uh, then we have the schister set, a cure of the Mayo, which is this one uh, on the top. Uh, yeah. And various uh, mats and bow schisters for dissecting and cutting tissue pointing to the left, which are this one. And uh, while pointing to the right, we have a thread cutting schister. Uh, on the top, uh, we have three balls of different sizes, uh, small, medium, and large. Uh, here we have uh, uh, also a metal cannula for, um, for suction. Then we have a box for cutting objects on the top of the top left uh, of the display. Then we have gauzes, uh, 10 for uh, 20, dissecting swabs, which are inside uh, this package. And uh, in the end, we have the suture thread, which are this ones. In this case, we have uh, two zero, three zero, and four zero vitrile. Uh, each one will be mounted on the suitable needle holders according to the appropriate length and uh, bite. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, uh, Carlotta. I have a question for Mario from the surgical group of Bologna. Uh, do you perform always a five millimeter procedure? or sometimes the small babies, you prefer to use a mix with some three millimeters for two. Thank you, Giovanna, for the question. Yes, today uh, the girl is 10 years old and we use the five millimeters, but uh, if I have a taller or we use the three millimeter is better. The problem of three millimeters that we don't have the roticulator, can sometime is very uh, is very easy to move the drop back the esophagus. But uh, in in these cases, in the little child, we use a stitch and use uh, the stitch for uh, to pass the drop back to the esophagus. Um, this is this is the our strategy. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Someone else has some comments on this aspect. Okay. Uh, uh, Darius, hi, nice to meet you. Right. Mario, could I, thanks again for this wonderful, super professional presentation <laughs> of the instruments. Mario, um, would would you use uh, consider using the Nathan retractor as a liver hook? Because it's stable, it doesn't breathe, <laughs> it doesn't tire. Yes, we use oh. for the lever retractor. I show you what is the lever retractor that we use because it's not traumatic. Mm -hmm. And you see during the procedure, Holger. Okay. okay. What, about, what about the Nathan retractor? You know, this, this loop that is fixed to the operating table. Yes, now Available in different I sizes. show you also, before to start with the presentation of uh, Martin Lacker, what is the position of the Howard side trocar. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other comment? Darius, Darius, please. Uh, I prefer to, for smaller babies, I use a three millimeter, but always five millimeter scope at the umbilicus. And uh, what I would like to say is that, uh, that uh, I don't use any liver retractor. I just only put a grasper under the liver and grasp it to the, uh, to the diaphragm. So it's self, you know, keeping the, uh, the uh, liver and you have your free hands, you know, so you don't need any support, uh, any other support. Just only put the grasper under the liver and grasp it to the uh, to the uh, diaphragm and it will keep the liver just opening the area. Are you going to, to do the surgery? Thank you for this uh, comment, because there was a question from Francesco Molinaro about which kind of instrument do you use for elevate the liver. So we had three different options. One proposed uh, recently by Darius, one from Olga is the autostatic that I use too, and one from uh, Mario. So it could be nice to compare these different experiences. 
Professor Latke, good morning. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little late. I was uh, cutting videos last minute. I don't know how you prepare these talks, but for me, it's always kind of last minute style. Joanna already the anesthesiologist from uh, yes. Hyperactive Theater. Okay, so Martin, please wait a minute. We have the anesthesiologist really in the operative room, then we will give the floor to you. So uh, I, I suppose Dr. Latrofa, instead of Dr. Pazzini, is uh, the anesthesiologist today. Good morning, could you hear me? Buongiorno, yes. Buongiorno, sono la dottoressa Latrofa, sono l'anestesista. Buongiorno. Ok, good morning. Good uh, morning, I'm the Dr. Latrofa, I'm the anesthesiology of this operating room. Per questa paziente è stata fatta un'anestesia generale con induzione inalapindovenosa, è, è stata intubata, è posizionato un sondino nasogastrico in poliuretano per favorire il repere chirurgico. Today we performed a general anesthesia with the intravenous induction. We positioned an endotracheal tube and an nasogastric tube in polyuretan to help surgeon to find the perfect landmarks. La paziente è stata sottoposta a un monitoraggio standard per l'anestesia generale. <clears throat> Sono stati posizionati due accessi venosi di cui uno ad alto flusso nel caso di necessità di riempimento. Today we will use a standard monitoring of vital parameters and we position in two venous access. One of these is on a high flow access to avoid the use of central venous catheters. Per l'analgesia intraoperatoria è stato fatto un tap block trasverso l'addominal plane block che garantisce un'analgesia di tutta la parete addominale nella sede chirurgica. Today we perform a transversus abdominal pain block two for the local anesthesia of the abdominal wall. This kind of block lasts a few hours, lowering the post-operative use of opioids. Non è previsto per questa paziente un ricovero in terapia intensiva post-operatoria, ma ne abbiamo la possibilità qualora fosse necessario. For this patient, there is no need of post-operative intensive care, but we have the place in our department if it will be necessary. Thank you for the attention. Grazie. Thank you, Dr. Latofia. I have just a question for you. Uh, so uh, if I well understand, uh, uh, you prefer to do the top block preoperatively instead of that at the end of the procedure. Uh, which is the advantage of one choice related to the other. Ok. Abbiamo fatto il tap blocco preoperatorio perché ci garantisce un'analgesia intraoperatoria ottimale mm -hmm. con una, pochi oppioidi nell'intraoperatorio. Il tap blocco ha una durata di anche quattro ore per cui va anche oltre la fine dell'intervento chirurgico, quindi copre l'analgesia nel primo post-operatorio. Successivamente è sufficiente del paracetamolo nel post-operatorio. We used the tap block in the preoperative time because it lasts the lowering the use of opioids during the surgery and it lasts a few hours like four hours. In this way the pain is controlled during the surgery and even in the, in the post-operative time. In the post-operative time, it will be necessary also the paracetamol, avoiding the opioids. Okay, I think uh, I think your uh, your presentation was quite complete, uh, Mario. If you agree, uh, uh, yes. And now from the operative side, why sh we show what is the sides of the trocar. Where do you and, place the truck? And okay. after we start, uh, Martin, with the presentation. Uh, from the operative theater, Michele, you are ready? Yes. To show? Good yes. Morning. Okay. Good morning. To show the trucker side, please. And please show what is the and uh, the our retractor for the lever. Okay. Uh, the first trucker in the midline, uh, supra umbilical epigastric space. Uh, 
uh, two operative tracker in uh, hypochondrial left and uh, right and left, and uh, the accessory tracker in uh, uh, hypogastric. 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 Yes. And uh, the suspicion of the liver in the uh, epigastric. epigastric space. Okay, this is the, the, the standard. And if we have need the live retractor, please you show, is possible? Show the live retractor. This is the position. And please show like, okay. This is the retractor that to need we use, okay? The problem is that, uh, okay. The problem is that is wonderful in uh, for the five millimeters, but we have a problem with the three millimeters because uh, uh, before we have a, a very good retractor of three millimeters like this. Now is don't made and don't have in the in the commerce. Please, Giovanna, if you want to start with the presentation of Martin, and we return oh. in the operative theater when we are inside, okay? Okay, uh, there was just a question from Molinaro about the age of the patient. If I am right, is a 10 years old uh, patient. Is it okay? 10 yes. years old. Okay. Yes, 10 years old. Okay, so Martin- Is a, is a, 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 a esophageal atresia that is treated yeah. in, uh, and now have a problem of reflux, okay? Obviously, she has a persistent reflux. So, Martin, we are ready with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Giovanna, do you see my screen or? Please, yes, you we can see. move in presentation, but it's very clear. Uh, but this is the presentation mode, right? Is this the full screen now? Okay, yes, now it's full screen. Okay, good. So, uh, dear Mario, dear Giovanna, thank you for the for the opportunity, also, dear friends, uh, to 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 talk talk about uh, the different types of that was the the task for me, I guess, of fund applications. Um, and I don't want to present too much data unless uh, necessary. So the perspective of the pediatrician, especially in the in the small children below one year, is actually that uh, it's a it's a frequent topic this happy spitters uh, but uh, as as all of you know actually this uh, reflux symptoms subside uh, in a lot of cases before the age of one year so for any fund application in the first year of age has to be really carefully considered because the remission rate is really high the question is which patients have reflux and which patients have reflux disease and I think this is really a uh, uh, an important thing to distinguish. The symptoms of the disease of the reflux is really very unspecific. All these uh, symptoms you can see here on this slides can be at the same time or more or less as a single symptom and that can indicate reflux, but sometimes it's not so clear. The groups at risk are these that you see here, of course, uh, esophageal latresia, CDH, but also neurologically impaired children. There are talks with these topics in, in this session this morning. That's why I, I will not focus on the different uh, groups which are uh, at risk. Our workup is all our uh, patients get a contrast study not to prove the reflux, but to look for anatomic abnormalities like hiatal hernia, gastric outlet obstruction, or a malrotation. Then we do an EGD, we scope all these children, and at the end of that uh, endoscopy, they get this uh, impedance probe in, uh, which measures not only the acid refluxes, but the non-acid refluxes. After that, you can see this child is not like super happy about having this probe in the nose, but uh, then we monitor these children overnight and take out the probe the next morning. The problem is with these impedance studies is, is although we know it's superior to the pH monitoring, there is not a standardized way of reading this. There is no normal values. Uh, the analysis is not trivial. You, you need like uh, over 100 uh, studies until you have learned it. Our GI people are really good at that. Our pediatric gastroenterologists 
And it's very time consuming. It's a good study, but you need someone who does that study. And uh, then the question is, when are we at the point where we want to do surgery, anti-reflex surgery? When is this point? And this point is when the conservator of medical management has failed. And why? Ha and when has it failed? So this is really like a point that you need to discuss very carefully with the parents, that the outcome in the end is, is like the one you desired. I want to focus, of course, on the surgical part. Uh, as in every operation, we have a standard operation procedure uh, and, uh, and the position lock here um, that everybody, the anesthesiologist, the scrub nurse, the surgeon knows which equipment we are using to exclude all the factors that you can control prior to the surgery. I think that's really important. And we have now the 3.0 version of, of this lockbook, and it's really like uh, very important for our daily work. When the patients have a gastrostomy, like this patient, you need to uh, think of, should you take it down or not? Sometimes you can um, uh, leave it in. The problem is, especially when they have PEGs and some gastroenterologists did, did a, a PEG in the fundus, it's really not very easy to do the fundal application. In these cases, you need to take it down, then close it, and then create a new gastrostomy in the end. Positioning is at the end of the table and the monitor at the head of the, of the table as seen in this patient. You can position like this. You always want to stand actually at the, at the bottom of the table. Uh, can be like this is the ideal position also with just the legs spread. Then you don't have to worry about compartment syndrome of the legs. I don't, I never use stirrups. I'm really concerned of, of compartment syndrome of the lower leg. And in some patients like the cerebral palsy kids, it can be really challenging. You cannot spread the legs like on the right picture, or you can even not even get the legs out of the way, like in the left picture where they also have multiple bugs. Prior to the surgery, I place a bougie in all these children in order not to make a fundal application, which is too narrow. These bougies are, I think, very nice. There's a nice paper from Dan Ostley um, about the bougie sizes according to the weight. And there's also the rule of thumb. So the esophagus is the size of the thumb. So you can take the bougie, which is actually the thumb of that child you're operating on. And then you have an enough, big enough bougie in there that can really uh, make sure that, um, that you're, uh, first of all, not invading, injuring the esophagus because you can palpate that bougie during the surgery and uh, is, is not too narrow here, hydroplasty. What I also like is this angulated light cord adapter uh, because uh, sometimes, especially in small babies, it can be really like a uh, clashing of instruments. So on the left side is all is okay. On the right side, if this cable goes like this, like in a circle, it can really like uh, interfere and, and, and this is unnecessary trouble, I think. So I want to walk you through the three most common type of fund application, the complete fund application and the partial ones. What do all these techniques have in common? First of all, you need to lengthen the intra-abdominal esophagus and do a hydroplasty if they have, have a hydrohernia. Then you need to restore the angle of his, and then you do some wrap. And with that wrap, you also, of course, restore the angle of his. So these three things all the fund applications have in common. And the only difference is why this is in red is actually the wrap. The controversy is which fund application should you do? People say the Nissen is the better uh, control of the reflux and the partial fund application, whether you do it posteriorly or anteriorly, has lower rates of dysphagia, retching, gas bloat, and the transhiatal migration of the wrap. However, there is data I will show you later is not so clear. We have talked about uh, trocar positioning here. These are the trocar positioning I use, left and right hand, the camera in the umbilicus. And later on, you switch the camera to the epigastrium to see better. And this will be also the future side when you do a G-tube, uh, a Nissen, like uh, a gastrostomy in the same session. In that case, we suspended the liver by the right upper quadrant with a retractor as seen here. You can also, as Darius just said, do a liver retraction only with a grasper with or without a trocar. Uh, and in the right lower corner, you see the Nathanson retractor. This is the one I use now. 
This is the Nathanson retractor, which is easily applied. And it has different sizes of these this, uh, retractors for me is, is perfect because it's out of the way. It's in the upper field of the operation field. Okay, now, now I wanna walk you through the first uh, type of fund application. I don't know whether you recognize this guy. So this guy is Rudolf Nissen and he's quite worth talking about him a little bit because he's really a pioneer of surgery, of thoracic surgery. He was assistant in Berlin of Ferdinand Sauerbruch and he did the first successful pneumonectomy, total pneumonectomy in 1931. Then he had to migrate to Istanbul to, to flee from the Nazi regime. And uh, he was uh, chief of surgery actually in 1933 of the University of Istanbul. A lot of professors fled from Germany, Jewish professor, as you may know, at that time to Istanbul. There were like over, over 30, 50 professors there. And um, in 1936, he excised an esophageal ulcer in a 26 year old patient and he resected the esophagus and he was actually afraid of his anastomosis, whether this would heal. So he wrapped this anastomosis with the fundus of that patient. And then later on, a few years later, he, he uh, uh, met this patient again and he said, like, how are you doing? And this lady said, oh, I'm doing great. By the way, the heartburn I always had at that time improved. So this Nissen fund application was actually invented by an incident. And he published the first two cases much later in 1956, uh, this technique, which was actually done much earlier. And as you may know, he emigrated then from Istanbul to uh, the United States during the war. And he was also the surgeon who did the abdominal uh, ordered uh, aneurysm uh, repair of Albert Einstein. And he wrapped this aneurysm by that time in cellular tape. Um, and that actually, that surgery that Rudolf Nissen did in Albert Einstein extended the life of Albert Einstein by several years. So I thought that was uh, kind of uh, interesting for me to, to know who is behind that name Nissen, who is like uh, one of the most famous surgeons ever. So this is the start of a Nissen fund application, taking the short gastrics down. It's also in our video atlas uh, with the 50 most important operations in pediatric surgery, which a video per each chapter. And this is taking down the, the, um, the attachments between the stomach and the left cruise. Then you open the, this is really like, a, as you can see, like a small child. This is maybe like a few months old only. It's very easy in this child because the layers are very flexible. So this is the hepatic gastric ligament that is taken down. Of course, the hepatic artery is there also. And then we are almost through. This is like a chopstick maneuver behind the esophagus is like a very easy to, to really like get your instruments in there and spread. And then you have a nice plane. There's no really like a hiatal hernia here. The, the two crura are almost kissing each other. However, I always put a stitch in there. This is a, a ski needle with a silk suture. This is of course a non-resorbable suture in these fund applications. You can um, also use an Ethibond or Merceline uh, suture, but uh, the silk suture is really, really nice. I like the silk because when you when you tie it, it stays there, right? It's, 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 it's not like, like popping off again and it's a very smooth and nice, and in fact, it's very cheap. Um, and it comes also with a ski needle, which is very nice because the ski needle travels through a five millimeter or even a three millimeter choker very easily. So this is now the, the Krura stitch, which I, which I always do. And this is like done in a minute. Then you do your uh, maneuver where you pass the fundus behind the esophagus and then you do a very important maneuver, which, which you can see in a second. And this is called the shoe shine maneuver, okay? So you really want to have that, that uh, uh, fundus floppy um, around the esophagus. 
and some people call it floppy Nissan. I think every Nissan should be floppy. That's why it's not really like a, but yeah, you can sell it better to the to the parents if you say we did a floppy Nissan. You also can see there's a little splenic infarction there because some of the short gastrics exclusively um, supply the spleen. That, but this is no big deal. And then you, this is the first step of your of your wrap, and then you bring the fundus anterior to the esophagus and do like a floppy Nissen here. And then you do like two or more stitches and that's actually more or less enough. Um, what happened with Nissen? He became the chief of surgery at the University of Basel. He also had a call to Hamburg, but he never wanted to work in or be in Germany ever again. And uh, then he worked in Basel in private practice for years until he, I think, died in his office or like he was like worked until ever. And uh, he had a, he has actually very remarkable biography. It's in German. I, I, I also read it. He's really like one of the, the great surgeons I've ever heard of. So this is the second guy. I don't know whether you recognize him. He's uh, Alain Toupé. He was born in Paris. And he recognized that after Nissen fund application, there was a lot of dysphagia and retching. And that's why he thought, maybe you don't have to do a complete fund application. Maybe it's enough to do a partial fund application. And this would also help, if you see this image on the left door corner, the stomach not prolapsing in the chest. And he thought this was very important to fix this wrap to the crura. And this is a toupee fund application. You see the shoeshine maneuver again. Up to that point is pretty much the same operation as a Nissen. This is an older child, as you can see. This is an, an Athibond suture. And this is also this, you know, this Mercilene uh, tape, or you can lose a your vessel loop actually to pull on the GE junction to have a really like a nice intra-abdominal domain of the esophagus. And then this is like the first stitch on the left, catching the fundus, the left cruise, and the esophagus. And really to have that wrap very nicely sitting actually in the, in the hiatus. And this is the second stitch. And then you bring this together. And this is actually like a tagging stitch or a, a center stitch that, that you can do. <laughs> which then approximates this fundus nicer until you have this 180 or 270, you call it however you want, to pay fund application. He actually, when he retired, he never dis missed a single day at work, but when he retired, he never showed up in the hospital ever again. Um, unless, unlike Nissen, okay? So he was like, uh, then retired and um, sort of like drank red wine and had a Picasso paintings in Paris in his flat. So he was like, had a good life after the surgery career, lived alone with a mate. And uh, yeah, this is how he ended his career, André Toupé. And the third guy, as you may know his name, but he, this is how he looks like. It's not J.R. Ewing from, from, from Dallas or Denver Dynasty. It is actually Alain Tal. He was a South African who then moved to the United States to become a surgeon, internship at Johns Hopkins. And then he moved actually to Kansas. Why Kansas? Because he wanted to have a place, but I'm going to tell that, that um, story later. So Tal von der Plication is the von der Plication which is the most difficult to understand because it's, it's the anterior fundus that is sutured in two rolls to the first row, the half of the length of the intra-abdominal esophagus, and the second row to the diaphragm. I'm going to show you this first row of stitches. It goes from the anterior part of the fundus. I hope this... Yeah, movie. Okay, this is the first row of stitches, okay? Half of the intra-abdominal esophagus. This is taking the fundus. The video is of very low quality. I'm sorry about that. The reason is I've, I'm, I have, I was trained there, but at that time 
the video quality was not so great. I'm not doing thigh fund applications any, anymore. This is taking the esophagus mid abdominal length. And then this first row, sort of this is the second stitch on the esophagus. This is half of the length between the diaphragm and the stomach. <clears throat> this is an ethibon suture with this uh, of white color. And this is the last stitch on the right. <clears throat> and then this first row is finished. Okay, this is the first row. You still see a little bit of esophagus. And then with this second row of stitches, you're taking the other part, the more distal part of the anterior fundus and suture this to the crura and the diaphragm. It's not so, I think it's technical demanding operation because you have to stitch in different angles. <clears throat> it's a great training operation, of course. There's a little bit of bleeding there in, this, in the splenic area, but that's also normal. It always bleeds a little. Hmm. Okay, this is the second row and then your fund, fund application is done. So he actually moved to Kansas. Why? Because he had a hobby. He raised these cattle and he wanted to find a place where you could do surgery and raise these cattle. And uh, then he actually brought him to Las Vegas where he moved from Kansas. And there he actually ended his career as a surgeon and a farmer. So I thought that was quite interesting. Nissen like worked until he died more or less. Toupé uh, enjoyed life with red wine and, and art. And uh, Alan, uh, and Alan Tal actually was like a cowboy style with cattle. So, Talk a little bit about <clears throat> outcome. There's no difference whether you want to do a partial fund application or a, a complete fund, fund application. Also not in mentally disabled children, there's no difference. So whatever you're trained, whatever you feel comfortable of, you should do. However, you should talk to the parents that all these symptoms listed here can happen and that the parents have a realistic expectation prior to the surgery what they can expect because there's nothing worse than you sort of talk to them. We are doing a fund application and it will be great. Then they come back with symptoms and then you have a problem. You should tell them we can do this, but this can all happen. I think that's really important, especially when you want to talk about long-term outcome. Okay. This is the best study. The only study which really assesses long-term outcome very honestly. It's a Dutch study from Utrecht group and they looked at, 57 patients in the long term, and they assessed these clinically with a questionnaire and pH monitor. So what did they find? They find actually that a lot of those patients, after a significant amount of time, 15 years had symptoms. How many patients had symptoms after 15 years again? And the answer is, <clears throat> if my computer works, my presentation is, yeah, so the answer is 57% had symptoms again, okay? So that means that 43% after 15 years have pathologic reflux again. So what does that mean? A fund application is not for life. These symptoms come back and then you need to tell the parents it's a temporary operation to temporarily, not after 15 years, every second patient has symptoms again, relieve the reflux symptoms. In that study also, there was no difference in impaired neurological, impaired and normal kids. So gastroesophageal reflux and pathologic pH monitoring persist and or recur in 43% of all children. I tell this all the parents I operate on to have them really a realistic expectation. So the last topic I just want to briefly mention is robotic surgery. We have a robotic program since two years and have over 50 operations in, in, in uh, children also below uh, 10 years of age, uh, sorry, 10 kilo kilogram of weight. We are also doing fund application routinely. We have this Da Vinci XI with a dual console, which is really great because you can teach each, each other and it's a great training tool. And um, this is uh, the choker position is more or less the same. We also use the Nathanson retractor. 
Of course, the cosmesis here with the eight millimeter trocars is a little works, but um, I show you briefly a video. This is preparation of the left cruise. For those who do robotic surgery, it's a mixture between MIS and open, right? We are sort of like dis dissecting here, like you, we would dis dissect openly. This is preparation of the hiatus here. And the first stitch, I also use like uh, silk. It's like a 20 centimeter stitch. You can then do this needle driver can also cut. You can do the sliding knot like in any other patient. And it's it's really, to me, the fun application with a robot is much easier as a 3D vision. Your, your, your neck and your back is not aching afterwards and it's perfect vision. This is the Shushan maneuver again. And you see there's that bougie and this is the center stitch of a toupee fund application. And then these stitches we are doing. This, the, the, all the suturing is, is faster, right? It's like, uh, it's, it's very easy. It's like an open surgery. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, has not re revolutionized, but yeah, let's, let's put it that way. There's no clear benefit maybe for the patient, but for the surgeon, definitely, because it's, um, yeah, easier for me uh, and um, yeah, much better vision. So to summarize my talk, diagnostic workup for gastroesophageal reflux disease in the first 12 months of age, be careful because um, it can go away by itself. Contrast study is not a screening tool for reflux disease, just a screening tool to exclude anatomic abnormalities like a hiatal hernia, gastric outlet obstruction, or marotation. And the impedance study is better than the pH monitoring, but it's time consuming and you need someone who can do this. Treatment and outcome, partial versus complete fundo, there's no difference. The robotic fundo for me is easier, more relaxing. However, is it better? Cosmetically, obviously not, uh, but better for the patient. I doubt there will be any data and that this will be an ongoing controversy. Um, there's only one good study on long-term outcome, I think, which shows that um, GERD persists or recurs in almost every second child after 10 to 15 years after lab file fund application in that study. And we should tell the parents that uh, the benefit of a fund application may be not lifelong. I thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for this uh, uh, excellent lecture, starting from history and the result of each technique. I, I have to say that uh, I agree with you that robotic can be a, a new field of application for uh, in, a new technique uh, for the treatment of gastroesophageal reflux, especially in patient, neurogenic patient with difficult access, and especially with patient who has already a gastrostomy. So it could be quite easier to perform a robotic procedure instead that uh, a laparoscopic. And it's very important for the, uh, learning robotics too. I have today that just today, one of my young collaborators is performing <laughs> anti gar procedure in the biorobotic and I will show you some picture later because it can be connected. So I, mm, uh, I think there is uh, some question from uh, Francesco Molinaro. And in the meantime, I want to say good morning to Adrian Bianchi. I know that Adrian is there. Adrian is one of the most uh, uh, important actors in this field of uh, anti uh, surgery. Francesco? Thank you. Do you hear me? We hear you. Okay, good morning, Professor Salici Petitoni. Good morning, Professor Lima. And thank you, Martin, for your wonderful presentation. I make um, a consideration and a, a question. Uh, the follow up of this patient has to be a long follow up because, as you say, the recurrence of symptoms is high. The percentage of recurrence of symptoms is high after 10 years or uh, 15 years. Uh, 
Uh, then uh, in the literature, um, in the study, compare open fundoplication with the laparoscopic fundoplication, we can see that the laparoscopic fundoplication has uh, all the advantages of a mini-invasive surgery. But in terms of recurrence of symptom, the group of open surgery has less percentage compared with laparoscopic. I think this fact is, is my, my consideration, it's my opinion, is linked because uh, probably the, the accurate of uh, some steps of, uh, of uh, uh, fundoplication surgery, like uh, preservation of vagus or uh, um, the uh, good uh, uh, preparation of uh, uh, retroesophageal windows, the mobilization of fundus, is the very topic of this, uh, um, this, uh, this, uh, this surgical procedure. And probably in the uh, mini-invasive surgery, there could be a, a learning curve elevated for uh, uh, the creation of uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of a part. And uh, uh, probably this is uh, uh, the, the big difference. Then uh, uh, for the robotic surgery, we don't have a long follow-up now. Then uh, the study, uh, actually the study uh, are not so uh, clear because we don't have a long follow-up because he's a young surgeon. And now the, we are, there are not difference between a laparoscopic or robotic surgery. I think because of, as, as you show, um, the realization of uh, esophageal, uh, retro, uh, retroesophageal windows, mobilization of fundus is better with uh, uh, with uh, with robotic surgery. Probably um, this could uh, give a reduction of record of, of symptoms. What do you think about? Ah, dear Francesco, thank you very much. Non potrei essere più d'accordo, I would say. Um, uh, I think you summarized very nicely uh the the recurrent rate in in mis fund application laparoscopic fund application is higher and i think <clears throat> it's because people do not tie good knots people do not you exactly i just can echo what you said take not the steps like they would do in open surgery and I think this is not right. Then they should do an open fund application because a redo fund application is really not a fun case in a lot of times. And um, then the parents have gone through a lot of trouble. So I also think that with a robot, which is a mixture between open and MIS surgery takes out all the, 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 the flaws we had with MIS surgery. And in, in a conference in, in this year, somebody described it really nicely. The robot gave us back the dexterity. With the robot, we have two hands to maneuver up. With laparoscopy, we're like the kind of the alien kind of style. So I think better knots, better dissection, more accurate executing the steps of the operation is with the robot. And that's why maybe, we all don't know, the recurrence rates will be maybe as good as open. Thank you, I agree. And another, another thing, I. I realize a uh, uh, robotic uh, fund duplication in a, in a baby, in two babies uh, with gastrostomy. And I realized the fund duplication without uh, remove gastrostomy. Uh, probably this is another, uh, another uh, uh, thing that you can do with robotic because uh, it's uh, simpler uh, probably to, to, to access uh, this area without remove gastrostomy. Yes, yeah. I did. I, I, I think the same. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Martin, what, uh, do you have uh, some uh, more comments? Me? Holger? Hi. Hey. <laughs> Holger. Martin, wonderful talk as always. As always. And um, it's, it's inspiring. Taking us through history into modern times. But Martin, talking about modern times, do you really think that in 2023 we should we should still openly say that we couldn't tie knots good enough? Yes, I think I think yes, Holger. Unfortunately, yes, <clears throat> because I think one of the biggest problem is people operate on children laparoscopically 
and they they are not trained they do do, do not a lot of them do not do box training and really like tie knots in the box and before they go to the child they do not take advantage of the possibilities of simulation and yes i think in the broad land, landscape not in centers like your center <clears throat> or centers of expertise people do not tie proper knots i think this is this is I, I, I still or do not operate like when you would i don't know there is no study about it but i think in the recurrent cases where you would go back and watch the video, I don't think this would be impressive videos, to be honest. Okay, I, I agree with you. But that cannot be a justification to even go into the higher league of technical expertise with robot. I mean, just because people cannot tie laparoscopic knots and they don't do their basics, they shouldn't go into robotics. Is that the argument for the robot in your mind? Like you said, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so I agree that you should be a, a, a trained laparoscopic surgeon before going to the robot. But Holger, this is really a controversy. People think because this is more uh, like uh, close to open surgery. Then I go to the robot and I, I, I sort of like uh, do not take that stage of, 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 of bothering with laparoscopy. I don't think that's right. But I think it's reality. Now I see your point. Well, well justified. Thanks, Martin. Wonderful discussion. Yes, if if I can add something in the discussion, I think the ex robot experience is a little different from the laparoscopy, and um, uh, and is it, it it is much more easier the, uh, uh, to perform a robotic uh, procedure. Uh, by a young surgeon that used to uh, they, they 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 used to practice more um, uh, I mean uh, uh, um, informatic support than all the surgeon. This was uh, our we did a study. This is also an experience made from other group. So I think the learning curve by robotic could be shorter than a laparoscopy. There is a question from Darius. Darius? Okay, just would like to comment. Uh, congratulations, Martin, again. Uh, your lecture, I like it very much. And what I like very much that you underline uh, the importance of making sutures. That's what I think that people have a lot of problems that maybe this is also uh, the main source of maybe recurrence, you know, people don't know how to make a suture even in open surgery, <laughs> you know, some uh, people are just doing suture, but it's not the surgical knot. And I think in, especially in the endoscopic surgery, it's very important to have a good training, even that if you train to make the suture, it means that you, if you can do a proper, a very elegant endoscopic knot, it means that you are very experienced in endoscopic surgery because it needs a lot of eye-hand coordination. So other things are much more important if you are very well trained in endoscopic knots. So this is why we start an endoscopic course from just teaching people how to make a knot. So that's very important. I'm happy to hear uh, from you. And about robots, of course, People who don't do robotic surgery probably have uh, the most opinions. And I, I didn't start it, uh, robotic surgery. We have just received a robot at my, uh, at my hospital, but I am not fully convinced that the, even the new generation of Da Vinci is especially suitable for small children, maybe for older one. So I for me, it's still limited, but for me, robot it's a quite different area so probably uh, you need a lot of experience to start laparoscopic surgery with a conventional traditional laparoscopy endoscopy but for the robot you can start directly on the robot with a very short learning curve as giovanna mentioned so this is the future probably we need special instruments for children smaller ones smaller size maybe single port that in robotic surgery it's really advantage uh, so 
it's a new generation. It's a new way to go with the surgery and we have to go this way. Uh, even if we don't want, we are very traditional surgeons, but this was the same with endoscopic surgery. Nobody would like to do it. There are still a lot of people who are not doing it. They are still doing open surgery, but we have changed our mind and robotic is a future. So I, I, I agree with you also. Thank you. Adrian, Adrian Bianchi has a, some comments. Good morning, Adrian, again. We are very happy to have your expertise with us also today. Thank you. My computer gave me problems. This is why I didn't join previously. I want to bring us down to earth, and I want to say that which is not sayable. A surgeon who cannot tie a knot is an incompetent surgeon who should not operate should not be allowed to operate. Secondly, um, in the days where we have now robots, laparoscopy, a lot of technology, okay, uh, uh, we get lost uh, in experimenting with this technology. Uh, if you're going to use a technique, like you're going to drive a car, you are not allowed legally to drive a car unless you have a driving license and you have passed your exams. But with ro robotic and with laparoscopy, everyone has a go. The patients, the children particularly maybe, uh, are not experimental models. They are, they are people and we should respect them as such, just as though they are our own patients. So I'm sorry to be a bit negative, uh, but I think it's important to remember that our, our intention as pediatric surgeons is to do the best we can and to look after the children. Uh, finally, uh, if you are speaking with this program in particular to an international audience, you need to remember that not everyone has the funds to buy um, a, a, a robot and, and such like. Uh, and therefore, it's important to offer alternatives uh, to, to the individuals who do not have the luxury of having major technological advances. And my final point, and I will stop then, is all of this brings to the, to the fore the question of who should do gastro uh, 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 anti reflux surgery. Um, should it be done only in specialist centers with highly specialist robotics and such like and well-trained surgeons, or should it be open to all, including surgeons who can't tie a knot? Thank you. So, Adrian, Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> Giovanna, can I answer to the two comments? Yes. Okay. So, uh, first of all, Darius. Uh, and Adrian, I could not agree more with which what you just said. Uh, for, for Darius, uh, as you may know, uh, the sliding knot is very, very important. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 I witnessed you doing that multiple times. You also saw that in the robot, I'm doing that when I do the hydroplasty. So yes, people do not tie good knots and you can even tie an air knot with a robot very easily. And even with the robot, the sliding knot is the knot you should do. I guarantee you, because you were asking about the robot, is like, how did you feel when you were sitting in a Porsche for the very first time? Okay. I was sitting like an IMAX cinema. Of course, this is instruments that are, that are bigger, but it's really like, it is mind changing. I'm not talking about data. I'm not saying it's better, but the visualization and the dexterity and the intuition is so good that it is i'm i'm very curious how you think when you have done done your first cases for the instrument i'm very pessimistic that we will have a very short instrument soon because the reason is when you go to five or three millimeters the manufacturers say then this dexterity is the the, the instrument becomes longer and that's why is then the the range of motion is 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 a bit more cumbersome. So I think for now we have to to stay with eight millimeters. For Adrian, I can also not agree more. 
I think um, I started robotic program when I was like far beyond the learning curve of a fund application, having having done like tons of funders and uh, following up my 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 patients. But as I said uh, to Holger's comment, and I I think that's I think uh, Martin. We have to move to the operative theater. You have me from the operative theater? Yes, we, 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 we can see very well. Could you explain the procedure? What you have done till now? Giovanna? Yes, I, we are looking at Giovanna? a beautiful view. You hear me? Yes, I, hear, I am hearing you. Mario, yes, we are hearing you. Now, not anymore. From the party theater, Giovanna, you know, she will have me. Yes, I, I am. Don't you, I don't hear her. Yes, I am hearing you. Yes, I am Adesso è un po' disturbato, there are some uh, disturbing uh, uh, rumors. Giovanna, you listen me, you listen me. Giovanna? Yes. And you uh, see the picture from the painting theater? Yes, we are seeing the picture very well. The voice is you, not perfect. You hear me? Yes. The voice uh, is not perfect. Uh, if you if you if you see the image from the Creative Theater, Dr. Libri and Professor Gargano show you this is the lab. Uh, there is no problem to go back to the esophagus, and we prepare for the the stitch for the found application. We use uh, usually two stitch and one for to fixing the wrap to die pharma. Please, we connected from the operative theater to later for show the suture, okay? Okay, very well. So we can uh, continue with the discussion. Uh, Martis, excuse me, could you, if you yeah. have some uh, more comments, no, just you, can, uh, you can continue. That, um, uh, yeah, of course, a surgeon who cannot tie a knot, Adrian, um, should, should not be call himself or herself a surgeon. I also agree with that. Um, and also with your uh, question on specialization. In Germany, we have decentralized care. We need more centralized care. And yes, fund application, anti-reflex surgery, anti-reflex treatment, which is actually not always surgery, should be done in a team with GI people, nurse practitioners that uh, um, also account for or can provide a very good follow-up, which is really key also to learn from the patients in whom you should not have done a fund application, you know? And, and I can also not agree more than that on what you said. From an economic standpoint, it makes no sense to use the robot, right? Um, just the maintenance of a Da Vinci is between 150 to 200,000 euro per year. So that's why it's actually a minus business for every uh, hospital who has a Da Vinci. Um, and um, yes, not all hospitals have the financial resources for that. I just not did not cover all that because the, the task for me was to talk about the different um, um, technical steps of anti-reflux surgery. And of course I excluded TEGD because this is your topic. And that's, that's what all I can say about what you said. So 100% agree to both of you. Any other comment? So if uh, I am looking, I have no hands. So uh, I have seen uh, our good friend, Redda. Ah, Paolo De Coppi. Good morning, Paolo. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Giovanna. Good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning, Paolo. And uh, so, are, are you ready for your presentation, Paolo? Are yes. The one we have the red down. And then uh, uh, 
the vendor will present his experience too. So, Paolo, please go yeah, on. I prepare a little video to avoid glimpse on the computer, which I just registered. Paolo, if we need to have a short connection with the operative room in Bologna, I will stop you for a few minutes. But now, please go on. Yeah, of course. First of all, of all, is that when there's a damage of the developing central nervous system, this has significant results in dysfunction of various parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Therefore, is um, immediately comes to um, the understanding that is difficult to fix. Uh, there should be some time a dysfunction of the oral motor function, the rumination that can be associated together with gastroesophageal reflux, delay gastric emptiness. Paolo, we have some problem with uh, the voice. If you can uh, uh, augment the voice. Yeah, sure. The level of the, of the sound. Yeah, so is not recognized problem that affect more, for example, the delay gastric empty, the dysphagia, the constipation, um, and therefore those diseases should always uh, be kept in mind when designing the best treatment for gastroesophageal reflux for those patients. And of course, based on that, the first is the assessment of the nutrition. So is there adequate in or inadequate nutrition? And therefore, if it's unsafe or safe to swallow, and how we can improve that using enteral nutrition as ideal, of course, but if there's an intolerance to enteral nutrition, we should also consider parenteral nutrition. And there are sort of um, some tips uh, who have been suggested um, over the years to really maximize the different parts that are affecting these children, uh, like the nutritional status, as we say, the gastroesophageal reflux, the constipation that often has. Oops. Uh, it is being so complex that at the ESPGAN, the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Pathology and Nutrition, has developed some guidelines. And if we go in details on these guidelines, uh, we can really uh, start understanding how the nutrition, if it's adequate and safe or not safe, uh, really create a pathway for those children. So if you have an inadequate nutrition, which become unsafe, you have to use tube feeding. If there's an associated reflux, still you can control that reflux with medication or with some surgery as we go uh, in details to examine. On these uh, guidelines, there's a sort of steps and uh, um, in two of those steps, um, they talk about specific anti-reflux surgery um, and a recommendation from these guidelines is that a routine anti-reflux procedure should not be performed at the gastrostomy in neurologically impaired children and fund application um, in case of failure of medical treatment uh, should um, be considered. Uh, when we discuss about the efficacy of this anti-reflux surgery, However, um, the results are not very good. And in a recent uh, um, systematic review um, uh, published in the British Journal of Surgery, uh, there were only 14 studies that were selected uh, uh, for this problem. And based on those studies, the results um, 
which are low to moderate quality, show that anti-drug surgery improve the quality of life and reduce use of gel acid exposure in neurologically impaired children in short and also medium term. And uh, although anti-reflux surgery is a common elective operation, um, there's no rigorous pre-operative and post-operative evaluation, uh, which is uh, quite striking um, based on the reports. So the investigation that should always be considered when considering an anti-reflux procedure or actually evaluating the child with neurologically impaired and reflux uh, should include radiology. Radiology is important not only to see uh, the reflux and, and to see how massive sometimes this reflux is up in to the thoracic inlet, but also to see some of the indications uh, which are certainly more prone for surgery, like hernia or the consequence of a prolonged reflux, um, which may lead to stricture and, and sometimes children who are under medication develop a stricture and, and therefore um, uh, fail their medical treatment. Um, manometry becomes very handy and very useful. Um, you can have a normal uh, passage of um, or motility of the esophagus or the motility uh, can be completely impaired. Um, pH probe is important. Uh, it's, it's, it's very important that the probe is placed in the correct way. So you see in the first image how this should be just at the, uh, at the end of the esophagus before the sphincter. Um, but the probe can go into the bronchi, as you can see on this x-ray, or can go down into the stomach and therefore uh, being uh, difficult to evaluate the results. Uh, the pH impedance give a trace which is similar to these and numbers are being established for years. Uh, um, but uh, now the uh, value of the pH impedance is relatively low. Uh, we we'll consider the impedance and the pH impedance is becoming it, it is already the gold standard. The impedance, of course, give not only the value in terms of acidic reflux, but can examine all the reflux into the esophagus. And uh, uh, you can uh, easily see the uh, impedance during swallowing and during the retrograde, so the reflux. So you can have number associated to the value of the reflux. Endoscopy can be very useful uh, to evaluate with biopsy. Um, if there are other pathologies, can be treated like eosinophilic esophagitis, which is um, uh, a condition that can be treated and certainly should be treated before considering any anti reflux surgery, but also can give some aspects of alarm, um, like the Barrett esophagus. Um, which uh, prone more to the indication of surgery, um, uh, which uh, because of the degree of reflux that has caused that problem. Um, reflux, the endoscopy can also give some other information. So a, an MLB uh, can give information about the larynx and the effect of the reflux in the larynx and uh, uh, it's a useful one to, to have. But uh, the operation should come um, only in this group of patients as a failed or medical treatment. I will go more in detail for that, but that can involve also the fact that the child cannot tolerate the medical treatment or there are complications despite the medical treatment. The operation that we should consider in the spectrum include gastrostomy, anti reflux procedure, jejunostomy, and gastric disconnection that will be discussed later on in the day. So, the gastrostomy, uh, there are essentially two types of gastrostomy. One is the PEG, which is inserted endoscopically, and uh, 
uh, allow a minimal invasive procedure uh, with a flange inside the stomach, which will pull the stomach to the abdominal wall or the bottom, which can be a primary procedure or following another type of gastrostomy. The gastrostomy manage only the bulbar dysfunction of the reflux and can make also the reflux worse. Um, uh, it, one of the advantages of the gastrostomy that later on can be used as a track for the GJ tube insertion. Certainly what has been shown in the literature that fundoplication in neurologically impaired children is not mandatory at the time of the gastrostomy. And it has been shown that in neurologically impaired children with refractory seizure um, show almost no improvement uh, of relief of gastroesophageal reflux um, when you put the fundoplication together with the gastrostomy. So in those group of patients with refractory seizure, um, almost fundoplication should not be considered because it doesn't release the symptoms. However, uh, there are uncertainty regarding optimal treatment. A Cochrane review on 2013, and unfortunately um, in the last few years, there's not been much improvement to that. Their uh, status uh, was that we are uh, faced on the decision of either performing surgery or prescribing medication in children with neurological impair who undergo gastrostomy. And therefore, a full discussion with the parents should be done to make them understanding the fact that there's no clear um, uh, benefit or no clear understanding of the optimal treatment uh, for children that need the gastrostomy and have gastrosophageal reflux. So when considering the anti-reflux procedure, there are different type of wrap, uh, which could be uh, considered the one we prefer uh, at a greater on street hospital is the Nissan fundoblication, uh, which involves closing the posterior crura and then passing part of the fundo on the back, which get uh, closed uh, as a wrap, uh, usually with three stitches in front of the esophagus. So when we con when consider the um, uh, fundoplication is uh, there's a good study that showed that actually uh, the fundoplication is a good operation and um, when uh, children are affected by an associated scoliosis. So um, when you have an associated scoliosis with children that are really curved, it can be sometimes challenging to perform a fundoplication. And this study is from Japan, um, just published a couple of years ago, showed that actually both in the short osteoporotic results and in the um, long-term or medium-term complication, uh, there's no being associated with more curvature of the spine, which is reassuring when considering doing a scoliosis. Um, I'm not going much into details. You will see it live today, so um, I don't think we, we I need to show you the fundoplication. I think it's important uh, we use uh, this um, Nedison retractor for the liver, which gives good exposure to the crura. Um, we always divide a bit the short gastric and the gastrocolic ligament. <clears throat> and uh, uh, once that is open, we close the posterior crura with um, uh, two or three stitches um, here, um, depending on how large is the hernia. Certainly, neurologically impaired children would tend to close those um, posterior crura more tidy than in non-neurologically impaired children. Once that is completed, we pass the fundo back to the start, um, sort of a wrap, which needs to be a soft wrap around the esophagus, uh, uh, which is stitched in front of the esophagus. Uh, 
uh, with uh, three stitches, which will involve the esophagus, so with stomach, esophagus, uh, the wrap anteriorly, and offer what is a, a soft wrap around the esophagus. So, um, considering a group of children with and one year of age, um, and uh, we have um, uh, collected data retrospectively, uh, patient appeared. Uh, and the mean age of fundoplication was about seven months uh, with six kilo. <clears throat> and uh, a third of these patients were very small with less than five kilo. So I said they had a high association with neurologically impaired and they were syndromic uh, with other abnormalities uh, uh, associated. Uh, um, in terms of preoperative investigation, uh, we could do mostly uh, the upper GI contrast and the pH impedance. Uh, MLB was very useful, as I said at the beginning, uh, but uh, OGD endoscopy and biopsy were done in a minority of this group of patients. Uh, and almost 90% of these patients had a concomitant gastrostomy and uh, only a minority had a Nissan um, only. The conversion rate was very low, um, and this was mainly due to difficult ventilation on these patients. Some had previous surgery, so there were some additions, or, and some had uh, unexpected finding, like a gastric duplication. The postoperative course, just in the first year of life, 60% acquire ICU admission post-op, and uh, a minority require PN, uh, um, uh, parenteral nutrition. Um, we start a feeds very early, usually in the first postoperative. <laughs> Uh, problems and the complication reach as high as 50% in this group of patients is very important uh, when consent is asked to the parents uh, about talking and particularly retching uh, on the uh, first year of life with patients uh, with neurological impairment uh, was a significant problem. The mortality um, was, uh, was zero in the first 30 day related surgery, but um, in, it was significant um, in long term. And uh, it's because of the problem associated with those patients. So this is one of the larger retrospective studies um, in children that had Nissan less than one year. And this just to demonstrate that it's a feasible option in managing those patients, uh, but it's not free of complication. So the problems of the Nissan is that it's a non-physiological operation and doesn't address the poor gastric compliance and motility and their retching and uh, and can fail. Uh, failure is very easy to detect on upper GI. I'm sure many of you that perform this surgery have seen these images and even part of the stomach in the chest. And uh, when we have a fail, listen, uh, it's important not to decide to rush in to do another lesson. We need to investigate. Um, the use of anti reflux drugs is important and also gastrojejunal feeding. That gives me the opportunity to go to the next step that regard the jejunostomy and uh, uh, has a management of gastroesophageal reflux in children with neurological impairment. So, there are different types of jejunostomy. Uh, one is the Witzel tube. Um, it's very easy, straightforward. Uh, it's a side jejunostomy. 
lockdown with no anastomosis is, is, can become a bit difficult in small infants, uh, and the tube can block. I would always suggest to use a nine French at least uh, feeding tube. The six French get blocked very easily, but in small children, can be a bit challenged to put a nine French. Ruan Y is a safer gingenostomy because it can lodge a Mickey button with a balloon uh, and is certainly to be considered in children that uh, um, would need a long time jejunal feeding or in permanent jejunal feeding. Gastro J tube are also very handy and uh, because they can be place very easily through a gastrostomy um, uh, hole and uh, um, and there are different forms in small children so below 10 kilos um, you prefer to use a nine French tube that comes with the peg extension those those tubes are generally very well tolerated the problem those tubes they sometimes create a dislodgement of the flange of the peg, and therefore um, uh, this needs to be carefully rotated by the family, um, uh, only partially because of the jejunal tube. They cannot go under an 80 degree rotation, uh, but um, it's a way to prevent the, the flange to get embedded and have it a so-called berry bumper. A safer tube will be the uh, Mickey J, uh, but can only be used for children above 10 kilos. It's essentially uh, like a Mickey bottle with a jejunal extension. The extending the jejunum are very easy and safe to be placed, and their position can be checked, as you see on the image uh, below, uh, by using uh, contrast and radiology. The issue of jejunal feeding is that there's no reservoir capacity, so children must be fed continuously, an average about 20 hours. They need a pump at home. Um, they are um, associated sometimes to lose tool because of the type of feeding, uh, um, and this has cause from with NEC, even if it's very rare and the uh, um, position of the tube uh, must be as certain. Uh, we have done a study that was recently published on what to do uh, with the failure of Nissan complication and that's implication with the GJ2. So the management um, is difficult when you have a Nissan complication and the parents sometimes when you have a one or two, the parents are very unkeen to have another from application. And uh, we have done this retrospective review of um, patient collected during these 10 years uh, um, uh, with examining intervention of uh, Nissan from the publication in GJ. So during that time, we had 820 from the publication with a failure rate of about 20%. Uh, um, this uh, had uh, we were managed with jejunal feeding in 8% in at a redo feeding, redo nitrogen from the application in 15%. So in uh, uh, the um, in these patients, uh, um, um, 48, so 66% of uh, those patients. Uh, who had redunison, had comorbidities, and um, the majority were neurologically impaired. And uh, um, despite the uh, redunison, there was a failure of 43, which made the failure for the second nissen 35%. And those children um, that went uh, mostly to J GJ feeding, uh, um, uh, uh, with a, a total esophagus disconnection of one, um, and some had a reduction. Giovanna? Giovanna? Uh, yes, I am there. Yeah, you want to be connected with the operative room in Bologna? Thank you, Giovanna, from the operative so, theater. Paolo, 
Paolo, please wait a minute. Uh, Giovanna, you, you hear me, please? Yes, yes. No you hear me? Yes, I am. Yes, we are the from Operative Theatre. You see the, uh, the finally of uh, uh, the Nissan Fund application is one, two, and three stitch. The last one fixed the wrap to the diaphragm. And now the anesthesiologist show you that we check with the gastric tube, there is no problem for, uh, the, 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 it is not very short, the wrap, but is good. Okay. Okay, thank you. It looks nice. My uh, so do you fix the wrap with uh, the first stitch? The uh, I don't. I don't hear well you from the operative theater. Okay. Uh, uh, which kind? What is of the question? The question is: uh, uh, the first stitch fix the wrap to the diaphragm. Is this true? So. Mario, if you can hear me, we can discuss later. Okay. Could you hear me? No. There are some problems of connection, I think. La regia mi può aiutare? No. Mario, me? Giovanna, if you want, uh, I have only a few yes. slides left. Yes, uh, yes, we will finish your, your presentation. Slides left. Yeah. Slides. Yeah. Slides. Yeah. Slides. 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 for the 23, which make the failure for the second instant 35%. And those children um, that went uh, mostly to J GJ feeding uh, um, uh, and with a, a total esophageal gastric disconnection of one. Paolo, we, we need and to, some to look to, the, uh, to your presentation. There are not your presentation on the screen. I think you have to share again. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry but I, I think just got, uh, this way. Okay. okay. Yeah. So let me just move to the presentation. Now, now the is a, we, we can follow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, underwent other treatments, but at that stage, with the third failure, uh, this increase up to fifty percent. So um, the one that underwent jejunal feeding. Uh, had two to five tube changes a year with a tube dislodgement of about 34%, and there were no major complications associated to GJ change. Um, the failure rate of the Nissan, as I say before, is about 20% after the first Nissan. However, that increased to 35% after the second Nissan and to 50% after the third Nissan. So, in conclusion, um, the majority of the patient required further intervention after the second simple application were successfully managed with the GJ2. The chance of success decreased with every further attempt of the final application, and ideally a randomized study is required to optimize the patient selection. Um, when even that a failed gastric disconnection should be considered and as say will be discussed later on. Just to finish um, on the, um, what has been published on the topic, I think is important, this systematic review and meta-analysis, they show that higher recurrence rate or persistent gastroesophageal reflux symptoms are reported after formal application in neurologically impaired children when compared to non-neurologically impaired, there's a higher incidence of redo from the glycation in neurologically impaired children, but so normal children, and there's also a higher incidence of the failure of the redo from the glycation in these children. 
a CAPS uh, paper showed that um, in uh, the fungal application gastrostomy versus parenchymal gastrogenostomy for the gastrosophageal reflux, um, yeah. Children show that there's no differences when compared to two, the two in the rates of pneumonia or mortality. And there was a trend towards major complication in the fungal glycation in gastrostomy compared to the uh, GJ tube. And minor complications, however, were more common in GJ were compared to fungal medication. So again, there's no definitive answer um, to this treatment. And uh, uh, in conclusion, the treatment of gastroesophageal reflux disease is complex in neurologically impaired children. The MDT approach is essential to understand the best treatment for that single child. Surgery should be deserved to children who have failed the med medical management and the fund application safe, but has a high failure rate in this group of patients. And thank you again for the opportunity to discuss this and I would be happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. A very an excellent lecture with a lot of arguments to be discussed. Uh, I want to open the discussion to the floor. I can imagine that some of the auditors, Olga, Olga, please. Paolo, as always, I learn from you. I keep learning, and I'm so inspired by your wisdom and technical um, ability. One of the most striking uh, sentences was uh, the fund application is no physiological operation. And you had a nice slide. Could you dwell on that? Could you elaborate on that? Because that's what most important to patients and pediatricians. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, um, uh, first of all, um, it's, um, it's an honor to present among uh, uh, you know, experts like yourself in the field. And uh, um, I think what I wanted really to say is that we don't know enough about those children and about when it's beneficial to put or not put a fund application in any other operation. The studies are very slim. Um, there's this little comprehensive study that will tell us what to do in these children. So we need as a community to do more work on this. Um, and the other thing is that uh, it's um, the, the physiology of uh, the, um, the esophagus and the esophageal sphincter is such as that in manometry, we know there's this way of passing uh, the, the food, also there are some reversive way, of course, uh, um, uh, particularly after, uh, after the main meal. Uh, and the problem is that you increase that uh, lower esophageal sphincter uh, with the wraparound, uh, which makes it a non-physiological way with the manometry. So the manometry will always tell you if there's a listen there in the sense that it will tell you that there are some non-physiological movement of the esophagus. So if you stay strict to physiology, the gastroenterology that look at manometry will always tell you that that is not physiological. So it was it was a bit provocative, but I'm, I'm glad that you pick it up as always. Thank you. I want to underline the, your uh, sentence. We don't know enough about the physiology of gastroesophageal reflux, especially in neurogenic uh, patients. I have a question for you. I was a little surprised for the big number of uh, small children that you treated. So, um, uh, why uh, do you select to perform a surgery at that early stage? In my small personal experience, uh, I, I found that the results are better when the, the child grows a little bit. So goes uh, at least after one year of age. And uh, why you don't uh, choose to perform a first uh, a PEG or JPEG uh, to to ameliorate the nutritional status of this patient, you decide to go directly to um, surgery 
audio are performing a randomized study surgery against nutritional uh, device. Yeah, it, that's a very important And uh, Paolo, I... could you augment a little bit your voice? So in order to hear you better, because it's so interesting yeah, yeah. to follow. Is that better? Your... Is that better? It's better. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. The, so the, um, uh, the point you're making, Giovanna, is very important. So one data that I didn't present here is that over the years, we have decreased that number. Uh, so over the years, we have opt more to more conservative treatment like PEG-J and other GJ to avoid a Nissan in the first instance, particularly in the first year of life. However, uh, I must also say that we receive a sort of a biased population here at Roche and, uh, and more than 50% of the patients uh, um, were syndromic, uh, neurological impair and so on. So it's a, it's a specific population that I'm talking about. The other population that was there was um, a CF patient um, and, and cardiac patient and patients suffering from ALTA. I mean, those patients we have seen over the years that benefits of, uh, of the fund application with the idea mainly to protect their lung. Um, it's, it's children in the vast majority that will have, will be feeding through a gastrostomy. And, uh, and, and those children, the aim in that group of age in the neurological impair is to protect their lung. We, we see sometimes children that become older, even with GJ, and they have irreversible changes on the lung on the CT scan. And that's, that's probably what we need to be careful. So we have noticed over the years that we, we were probably doing too many. Then we went up to the, down to the opposite. So on the fact of don't doing enough, and now we, sort of reach an equilibrium in which GJ probably become the option or the preferable option, um, unless uh, we think there are those episodes that I mentioned before that require an urgent intervention. But I, I, I think it's an open problem and I am not coming with a solution, unfortunately. I think uh, we, we need uh, to do more studies on this. And, you know, the most interesting studies like the Cochrane, the systematic review in the British Journal of Surgery, which no conclusion in the sense there's no enough data, to, even when you talk to the parents to justify one treatment or the other. So thank you. There is Guantova. <laughs> Our president is one of the most experts in uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Of course. He was uh, one of his major field of interest from the beginning of his career. So we are very glad uh, and honored to have his advice. One, uh, please, uh, uh, we can hear you. Please okay. open your... Okay, uh, Paolo, congratulations. That was uh, that's, that's in, oh, sorry. Okay. sorry. Okay. I want to further comment on the fact that uh, all uh, anti reflux operations are unphysiological, which was mentioned by Paolo, and I fully agree with that. But I uh, have to recall you that, in fact, in the best case, we can create a competent valve, mechanical valve that in some way replaces the uh, very sophisticated natural valve that we have, but it is much more complicated, but we cannot act on the other components of the disease. So we cannot act on peristalsis. We cannot act on gastric emptying, or uh, essentially we do not, we, we sometimes we can, and we cannot uh, impact on the nature of the refluxate. So, by definition, uh, any fund application, although mechanically active, is an imperfect way of uh, uh, trying to simulate what is natural uh, in a healthy individual. 
But at the same time, I want to stress that uh, you cannot uh, give all the fill to the gastroenterologist or the pediatrician because they use and physiological methods as well. Nella pausa, chiama giù pesci e fai controllare quella roba lì. They cannot act on peristalsis. Remember the sea surprise thing and all the things that we had that really weren't useful at all. They can only use PPIs that uh, act on the acid component of the reflux state, but nothing uh, in the alkaline or non-acidic non -acid, uh, component of the reflux state. And uh, uh, of course, they cannot act on gastric emptying either. So our system, what we can offer to the patients is not perfect, but what they can offer to the patients is not perfect either. So we are uh, in, in, in an arena that is very complex where we can provide a part of the solution in some cases, but they cannot provide a solution for life in all the cases uh, either. So. Uh, that's the arena where we have to fight. And I think Paolo's talk has very well explained that in a particularly challenging group of patients, that neurologica impaired patients that are uh, one of the more difficult uh, group, most difficult group to treat. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more as, as always uh, with uh, Professor Savar. I think it's very important that we don't leave this to the medical um, colleagues, uh, because what I was talking about, about doing too many at the beginning, is when we noticed that the medical were more in charge, some of the patients that were not offered a fund of location end up having no reversible changes on their lung. So it's, it's very important uh, that uh, we select the patient but then we still offer this as an operation to these children. Thank you. Darius. Darius, Darius, please. Oh, thank you very much. Just Hi, Darius. Nice to, nice to see you. Congratulations of lecture. Uh, just my question is, you know, sometimes in this special group of patients, we have an indication just to place on a gastrostomy, sometimes to do the fund application when both, you know, and because you know just indication for fund application are not always clear even that the patient has a lot of problems with its feeding so usually we start with the gastrostomy would you like to do both procedure at the same time or just would you like to divide it sorry if i missed it in your lecture no, it's very important uh, so the studies uh, that i presented show that uh, in patients that are retching Certainly, so doing a fund application at the same time is not a good idea because they do much worse. It's still a retrospective study, um, but it, they do much worse than the ones that receive the gastrostomy alone. Now, there is a couple of studies that you, uh, you, you're probably aware of out from Japan that show how you can do a fund application after the gastrostomy with no difficulties uh, in the sense that you can place a stitch around the gastrostomy and pull the gastrostomy in this way. I personally don't see that problem, but techniques have been described, but certainly there's no data. And I think that's, that will be a very important study, which show if a fund application after a gastrostomy has more chance to fail, because in a way you pull part of the stomach Sometimes when you do a peg, you don't even know exactly where you put your gastrostomy and going back for a fundo can be a problem. So I think that type of study is still missing. And uh, I think a forum like this would be the right one to do it. Uh, to my experience, I, if there is some doubts, I usually prefer to do the gastrostomy and later fund application because, you know, usually endoscopic gastrostomy makes not many trouble and even it is helpful because it fix you a stomach and it's much easier to do the fund application of course sometimes we had a lot of adhesion sometimes it happens if there was any complication with the gastrostomy but usually it's not a contraindication so my follow is first gastrostomy usually we improve the nutrition of these patients and sometimes 
maybe for a time the reflux disappear and later maybe if the baby is not doing well we do the fun duplication that's my yeah. no i agree and and the alternatives are now free of complication as well i mean the studies that i've shown show that even if minor gj tube also have complications on those patients uh, and uh, I don't know if any in the forum have seen this, but certainly I've seen four or five children that with the <clears throat> J. Mickey had a displaced duodenum that looked like a marotation because there was so much push on the duodenum that, that the DJ was, was pushed on the right. So, I mean, th this, these type of things are not minor to these children. And uh, so the alternatives uh, are just not e easy or, or free of complication. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Different opinion, but very, it was uh, so nice to have this uh, uh, discussion from an expert. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen till now other hands raised, so. Adriana, do you have any comments? Uh, no, nothing particular that I will not address in my talk later on. Um, but uh, I am I am worried and concerned that children, particularly with neurological impairment and other serious complications, end up having a long period of time with, for three fund applications. Uh, which we know uh, are, are more than likely to fail in over 50 to 70 percent of the time. And that brings up the question of what it is one should be doing. Um, I agree that studies are important, but the parents want a life and they want a child who is not in hospital all the time waiting for the results of the uh, uh, studies. So I leave it at that, but it was a lovely um, exposition of the present situation. Thank you, Paolo. No, thank you, Dr. Bianchi. Uh, uh, it, I think uh, it's very important uh, what you said, uh, and uh, you know we learn from your experience, and and I I have also some personal experience on the disconnection, which in some of these children really changed completely the life of the family, and. Um, and, and, and this is the option that I would offer to the family after the second failure, uh, to be honest. I, I haven't been probably courageous enough uh, uh, to do it as first operation. And uh, I, I'm looking forward for your lecture uh, for, um, for this. But, um, uh, but I think it's, it's a very valid option that should be discussed with the family earlier on. Uh, I just didn't discuss it in my presentation because uh, we are looking forward for yours. Oh, thank you very much. That's perfectly fine. Yes, we know that uh, you will uh, present us your uh, huge experience uh, in uh, this connection. So uh, I have seen uh, the veranda in the, in the screen. I think Martin. Has Martin has yeah. some question. Okay, Martin. Hi, Martin. Congratulate Paolo for the for the presentation, and I I agree also with the concept only to put a gastrostomy and not do a fundo primarily because if these children do have dysphagia, gas bloating, and retching and dumping on top, that's a big burden. That's so that's why I think start with a gastrostomy and then maybe GJ tube. I, I I'm a little surprised about the dislocation rate of one third. So I think if you if you do not turn the GJ tube, because this is when it comes off uh, out of the du duodenum, then you might have lower rates. So, so my question, I guess, is how do you, why do you think there are, why is the dislocation rate so high? Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the possibly, I mean, those are all inserted by interventional radiologists. Uh, and the the, uh, the length uh, sometimes is a question that we debate. Uh, so the J extension, um, we 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 will tend to put it longer 
while they will just tend to pass the DJ and they will happy with that position. Um, and the, the problem also, I think is related to the fact of dysmotility. Um, so some of these children would have a severe dysmotility. And I think those is the one that you need to be very careful because that wave of dysmotility can also bring back the GJ. I mean, I've seen a few patients that had the J extension coming out from the mouth. Um, so the dysmotility can be quite severe. Dangerous, yeah. Uh, Paolo for this uh, wonderful lecture and plenty of, uh, of uh, argument to be discussed and also plenty of science. And now I, I, give the, I will give the floor to our president, Guan Tovar, for his presentation about uh, gastroesophageal flux surgery in neurological patients. Then uh, you, it will be the, the time of uh, the Brenda. Guan, okay. can you hear me? Yeah, Gwen? I can hear you. I can hear you. Is, no problem. Okay. Perfect. I, I'll share. Oh, what's the problem here? Is it doesn't like. Uh... Can you see it? Uh, okay, not yet. Not yet. You have to share the screen. Yeah, yeah, I did that, but that doesn't, yeah. Well, says that uh, cannot uh, share the screen. Uh, uh, give me a, a code of error. Uh, what can I do? Mm. Uh, I asked the Regia. Uh... Juan, if I can suggest, close down and start again. Okay. In the meantime, there is a question of Esma Seovic. Uh, in case you decide only to do gastrostomy, uh, which kind of gastrostomy do you prefer, laparoscopic gastrostomy or PEG? And do you have any comments about placing PEG under laparoscopy? If I can say something, then the, I, there are other experts uh, in this uh, meeting. Uh, I think uh, you uh, uh, endoscopic pack is quite easy to place. Laparoscopy, in my experience, is reserved to a patient uh, with uh, a very complex an anatomy. I mean, uh, with severe scoliosis, uh, where it could be difficult to place uh, in the right place the gastrostomy uh, by endoscopy because uh, the instrument. Uh, generally will not uh, uh, reach the abdomen, but the inter intercostal space. My opinion, this is the indication of a laparoscopic uh, uh, PEG. Otherwise, I prefer the endoscopic way. I don't know if there are some other comment on this field. Guan? I think I have um, I have a comment on, on, on that, if you allow. So I think the major disadvantage of the PAG is that you have a, a bumper and, and parents, in my experience, they love to have the button where they can disconnect the cable from that button. And the second thing is, I think it's easier to place a gastrostomy on the laparoscopic vision at the perfect spot where it needs to be for a later fundal plication. Whereas when some gastroenterologists, they place pegs in the fundals or not really in the right and the larger curvature at the corpus, and then it's very difficult. Um, so I think um, the laparoscopic assisted usage, gastrostomy, the Jorgensen way is the way to go. Martin, can I, I just ask you? you? Can I just ask you to clarify, which is the perfect spot? The perfect spot is actually at the larger curvature where you would think that placing in 
a balloon would not obstruct the antrum because this can also happen if you're too close to the antrum and allow a nice fundal placation. So maybe between the antrum and the corpus, but not too close to the antrum. But that's a little Salomonic way of answering your question. The perfect spot is where it does not obstruct the antrum and does not interfere with later fundal placation. So, so maybe at the point where the right gastroepiploic artery finishes, and then there is an area which is, I won't call it a vascular, but not big blood vessels. Yes. On the greater curve. Thank you. Paolo de Coppi. Thank you, Andy, and, pa and thank you, Martin. There is a question from uh, Paolo yeah. or an answer. No, I mean, I just wanted to say that I agree with Martin that uh, the laparoscopy give you the security of placing a gastrostomy in, in the place um, you want. And this is particularly important for children where you think a fundal application may be beneficial later on. Um, I mean, I, I, I prefer to put pegs usually, but uh, in these type of patient, uh, if you think that you would need to do a fundal application sometime, the peg doesn't really land on the place you want it. So, um, but it's a, it's a good uh, question. I'm sorry, but I cannot, uh, I cannot share the screen. I, I have an error number here and I went out, I went in and uh, I cannot. So what can I do? I can wait for... So I think, uh, I think uh, one, if you uh, want to send uh, your presentation to me or to Mario, we can share the screen for you. This okay. is one uh, thing, uh, if, if, if it is possible. To Mario, it may be easier because he has the regia, okay, but uh, yeah. I am available too. Uh, in the meantime, I ask uh, the Devenda to start mm -hmm. his presentation, if it is uh, ready. The Devenda is now in Australia, I think. So, okay. <laughs> so I, it's a different time. What I time it is that there? Uh, hi, Joanna and uh, uh, Professor Kuantor. Nice to see you face to face nice today, to though, online. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, in Australia and Sydney, it is uh, past 7 p.m., uh, eight minutes past seven. So I think you should be 11, uh, eight minutes past 11 in Italy. Sì, voglio avere, voglio avere quante, come è grande questa presentazione. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the Brenda, uh, are you the full screen? Yes. We we don't hear you now. We need to have your voice. You can uh, uh, the screen. You can see. Okay. Uh, the screen Joanna. is okay. Ah. The voice too. Okay. Please start. Voice is okay? Voice is okay now, perfect. Right, okay. Thank you very much for, uh, for let me compliment all the speakers uh, who have done a wonderful job and uh, talked on uh, this very important topic where we don't have so much of clarity as well as unanimity in our understanding. And uh, uh, the talk that uh, I plan to cover this uh, evening is uh, related mostly to uh, reflux related to TOF and also uh, our some experience related to CDH. Uh, so uh, let us talk that why this reflux uh, after TOF repair? why we are really concerned. Uh, we all know that after repair, there is a fibrosis at the site, then there is a motor dysfunction as well because of the muscle disconnection and the re-anastomosis. And in that process, there is a damage to the intrinsic nerves. 
there is a short intra-abdominal lease of fetus that has been pulled because of the anastomosis in the chest. And also the angle of the hiss is also lost as is seen in most of the dye studies after surgery. So these are the factors which contribute uh, the initiation of gastroesophageal reflux in the top cases. Uh, the story in each type of TOF is little different that the esophagus is continuously present. It is not pulled up, but uh, because of the continuous flooding of the trachea with the H type fistula, there is a, a very high incidence of chest infections. And that is the reason there is a lot of coughing and choking and increase in intra-abdominal pressure. And then there is a this invites the frequent reflux uh, into the chest, into the pharynx and the recurrent infections. So the pathology is though different, but it's a very high incidence of the reflux. And we have seen cases in H-type fistula where the lung is badly damaged and even pneumonectomies have to be done. So, <clears throat> Uh, similarly, the uh, reflux in difficult cases of the top, and we all know that when it's a wide uh, gap fistula or atresia, wide gap atresia or esophageal pure atresia, then there are various techniques uh, which have been adopted to bring the esophageal ends together, but in bargain, we lose something. Uh, like uh, the delayed primary repair, which was published long back by Professor Prem Puri, uh, after waiting for about uh, two to three months or even several months, though two ends can come together and primary anastomosis can be made, but see the results. The symptomatic reflux was in two thirds of the patients, 14 out of 21 and fundoplication was required in large number of these. So <clears throat> any procedure that is required to bring both the ends together under tension, even after late uh, anastomosis means delayed waiting, uh, the chances of the reflux is very, very high. Similarly, now many people are talking of the focus technique to bring the two ends together and this results because of uh, bringing the traction sutures together and it also takes four or five weeks or so. And then primary anastomosis. And this also heals with fibrosis. And of course, because of the traction applied at the two ends, the muscles at these ends cut through and we have seen that it is not a normal type of the esophageal end. And this results again to poor healing, uh, healing with fibrosis. And there is of course a esophageal pull from the lower end and uh, muscle damage at the ends, fibrosis uh, resulting into uh, a dynamic uh, esophagus at this point. And so again, there is a very high incidence of the reflux after focus. So also after Kimura's technique, uh, he himself reported 12 cases in 15 years in combination from US and Japan and see the incidence of reflux. 11 cases out of 12 had reflux. Again, for the same reason that with the repeated surgeries of the uh, esophageal lengthening in the chest, first, second, third, fourth, and sometimes even fifth. So apart from the recurrent pneumonia, there is a loss of the esophagus and fibrosis at the ends of the esophagus. And because uh, uh, the uh, healing with fibrosis and pulling of the esophagus of the lower end, there is a, again high incidence of the reflux. Uh, not many people do Charlie's technique, but yes, again, uh, when we divide the lesser curvature of, of the uh, stomach uh, to make the anastomosis feasible in the chest by pulling the upper half of the stomach into the chest, 
it not only it makes it unphysiological with paradoxical respiration and the food settles between chest and abdomen. Uh, usually in such a situation, of course, the anti-reflux procedure is added there and then to take care of the reflux. But still, despite that, it is noted that there is a very high incidence of the reflux, though the experience with this procedure is very limited and not many people resort to this. But yes, those who do or consider Charlie's technique to achieve primary anastomosis in the chest, uh, the incidence of um, reflux is uh, quite high. Next procedure which is adopted to achieve primary anastomosis in top cases is the division of the left gastric vessel. Though one can achieve two centimeter or so uh, length of the esophagus, but again, the problem is that esophagus is pulled up into the chest and resulting into very high uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Another similar situation comes when there is a post tough repair uh, structure, like in this case, a limited structure in the chest and dilatation has failed and it requires resection and anastomosis. So again, the lower esophagus is pulled up and uh, this results into again reflux and worsening of the stricture even. So all these cases related to TOR have a tendency to not only develop uh, reflux, but also uh, the stricture at the anastomotic site. So how common is it? After TOF repair, uh, the incidence is very high say varying uh, almost, let us say, two thirds of these cases develop uh, reflux, but not all of these will have uh, the need for surgery. But quite often uh, they respond to medical management. At the same time, uh, we know that after TOF repair, the respiratory symptoms are common. Say almost half of these patients develop various types of symptoms and 74% of these symptoms are supposed to be because of the uh, reflux. Uh, then there are other problems, pneumonia, aspiration, choking, and cyanotic, uh, the other problem, other uh, things responsible for the respiratory symptoms, but almost three fourths of these are because of the reflux. Similarly, uh, we know from uh, our experience that uh, when you do the esophageal replacement for any uh, using any of the uh, organ, colon, stomach, jejunum, or gastric tube, the incidence of the reflux is uh, still quite high, especially after the gastric tube. On an average, 15 to 20 percent of these patients they have the problem of the reflux. So all these are in post-op TF cases that uh, are responsible um, for causing the reflux. Uh, in our series uh, and in our follow-up uh, uh, study, we found that uh, in our gastric pull-up cases, the deutinogastric reflux that was diagnosed by HIDA scan, the initial reflux was noted in two thirds of these patients. And subsequently when waiting for an year or so, uh, this reflux incidence was reduced to almost 40%. Uh, so post-operative reflux seen at three months in two thirds of the cases after gastric pull-up, and this reduced to 40% at one year follow. But the problem is that this is a serious, phenomena, DGR in um, uh, post gastric up because it can lead to uh, risk of metaplasia that is a serious one with changes in the mucosal pattern uh, from the normal gastric mucosa to an industrial mucosa. And uh, so they need a constant follow-up. Uh, <clears throat> Similarly, when gastric pull-up is done, this is mandatory that uh, one has to uh, do uh, uh, pyloromyotomy or pyloroplasty. Uh, that's a component so that there is a good clearance of uh, stomach contents. Uh, 
and uh, to prevent the reflux. Similarly, after colon, though it is not a common phenomenon, but yes, it can happen. Uh, this is the stomach, this is the colon anastomosis, and we noted that in this case, there was a frequent reflux from the stomach to the colon, resulting into dilatation. And so uh, this requires to be handled uh, in a tough case, uh, requiring a redo cologastric anastomosis and the reduction of the colon uh, to relieve the symptoms. So these are some of the problems uh, where uh, the reflux is noted in tough cases. Well, so also is this situation in uh, stricture cases. Uh, this was a limited stricture here in a post alkali, uh, say, sodium hydroxide pellet uh, injection. So, limited structure, and uh, we thought we can resect and re anastomosis. We did that. Again, stricture appeared. We again did that. But at the same time, abdominal lesion figures was mobilized, though. This native esophagus has been preserved, but it is at the cost of the severe reflux. Maybe that we used fibrin glue here for the anastomosis in the uh, esophagus in the chest. So that has resulted into repeat stricture. So my advice would be that to avoid fibrin glue uh, while protecting the esophageal anastomosis in the chest. Uh, other associated problems can also have, of course, the reflux, common problems from fellow seal gastrociasis, malrotation, factors deformity we have seen with reflux, uh, like in this boy, hiatus hernia, not uncommon paraesophageal hernia, and diaphragmatic hernia. So these are also the other conditions where the reflux is also known to occur, and we have managed when reflux occurs with these conditions, most of the time these require surgery. Uh, of course, medical management uh, is the first one, and this is also our policy to start with the um, uh, antacids and the prokinetic agents. We try to avoid cisapride for long, not more than six months at any given time. And of course, the regular follow-up is again mandatory. Uh, but yes, this preventive therapy uh, is of great importance whether it is an infant, child, or an adult, uh, preventive therapy has to be adopted and has to be adopted sincerely. In children, it has to be uh, very small, thickened, and frequent feeds, and uh, the last feed should not be given at least two hours before the bath. So coming to the surgery, our uh, approach has been that yes, uh, out of all these surgical cases diagnosed with reflux, not all of them require surgery. Only one third of these required surgery. Uh, and uh, only one third of these required uh, early surgery say, when diagnosed because of the severe symptoms and severe reflux. Uh, usually uh, after six months, and rarely, uh, I remember only few cases that uh, we did the reflux surgery before three months of age. Uh, of both these, Thal and Nissan, what we have talked just now, our approach has been Thal, and I'll come to that, why it has been so over the past 30, 40 years. Uh, we have not been doing the open or laparoscopic or robotic uh, uh, by choice. Uh, the main objection for Nissen, and we believe that yes, it has a merit, that a complete wrap in such cases where the esophagus has already been handled, there is an element of fibrosis, there is an element of muscular uh, damage, there is an element of nervous damage in the chest, so I think this esophagus is not normal. The peristalsis are not normal. And any complete wrap at the lower end uh, is bound to create more uh, problems, dysphagia, uh, obstruction to food, bloating is not uncommon, and of course, resulting into repeated aspirations and pneumonitis. That is the reason 
the Nissan fund application is not uh, my first choice. Why? Uh, why Thal is the first choice? Uh, it, the story goes back, and I was happy to see from Martin's uh, presentation uh, about Dr. Thal uh, devising this uh, Thal anterior wrap. And uh, he moved to Kansas City, and uh, Dr. Keith S. Kraft was there. Uh, I'm sure you know him, an eminent surgeon. He was basically a cardiac surgeon, but uh, doing pediatric thoracic surgery as well. And uh, we had the personal equation with him. He visited our center somewhere in uh, late 80s. And uh, he suggested, and he showed also during a workshop about the Thal procedure. And uh, his operative technique was a little bit more uh, extensive, I would say, than the uh, operative uh, videos I saw today. Uh, I think it was uh, about five centimeter, uh, at least in the abdominal esophagus where the anterior, I uh, mean, the fundus, flap is going up, starting from the left side of the esophagus uh, at the angle, going right up to the diaphragm. And at least three sutures were put with the diaphragm and the esophagus, one on the left side, one anteriorly, and one on the right side. And then coming to the right length of the esophagus. So it was practically a good creation of the angle of his uh, partial wrap. And uh, uh, we were quite happy with the procedure. And that is how we started with it and continued with that practice. So uh, I think this was our practice to use the Thal anterior wrap. Uh, in a couple of cases, I have used Tuke, the posterior wrap, quite simple. But I think uh, our operative work for a wrap has been a little bit more extensive and more rigid. and putting all the four components, mobilizing the interabdominal esophagus, dividing the uh, esophagophrenic ligament, and uh, putting the proper wrap at least five, six centimeters, and doing a U-shaped suturing with the esophagus and the uh, stomach. And so uh, uh, I noted that a uh, very high incidence of the recurrence rate uh, after wrap. That has not been our experience, but yes, few cases have been with the recurrence, but not that kind of high incidence. So that is my uh, comment uh, regarding the surgical option that we resorted to. Uh, this is uh, uh, our limited experience uh, of the reflux in tough cases. Uh, this is uh, the experience from my past institution. Uh, 124 cases and uh, uh, 3.5 months, uh, say, uh, mean uh, after surgery. Uh, the symptomatic cases, 55%, uh, presenting with various symptoms. And asymptomatic cases who came for routine follow-up, say, 45 cases. So let us say half, half cases symptomatic and uh, asymptomatic cases. And uh, the incidence of the reflux in uh, asymptomatic cases was again about uh, uh, less than half. And symptomatic cases, the incidence of the reflux was uh, more than half. Uh, but yes, mild, moderate and severe. The important point to note is that even if there were no symptoms and patient presented, they still had incidence of the reflux. And 12% of these had very high or severe degree of the reflux. Demonstrated uh, on uh, imaging as well as on uh, pH monitoring. Uh, when symptomatic cases are concerned, they had not only high incidence of reflux, but also the severity of the reflux was quite high, uh, almost uh, 40%. So the incidence and the severity of the reflux after TF repair was significantly higher in children 
with symptoms as compared to those without symptoms. So of these um, post TOF uh, reflux cases uh, in all 58%, that's 73 out of 124, all these had symptoms. The 55% presented with symptoms and 45% presented with no symptoms. So 35.5% uh, symptomatic had severe GI and only 12% of asymptomatic cases had also severe GI. Not all symptomatic patients had reflux. So this is also important point to find that we had uh, 67 cases who presented with symptoms but only 48 had the uh, reflux. And reflux also seen in asymptomatic patients, 25, almost half of these they also had, but usually it was mild or moderate. Then 85% of these, they responded to medical therapy and it continued for six months to one year uh, with the PIP or with the renitidine group. Uh, most of these uh, alternating, not uh, continuously with one, group. So, and only 15% required uh, thal surgery and all as a planned procedure. Uh, the second component I wish to cover here is that reflux in CDH cases. Uh, not much information is available to us with this problem. And uh, we studied uh, this component uh, in our institute uh, long back, about 20 years back. One of my residents, uh, who is now the consultant and professor head in another institution, he did this work. And out of 41, uh, we had 24 cases who were surviving. Uh, most of these were males uh, with various, uh, these shows the parameters. All these uh, patients were stabilized in our ICU, surgical ICU, and then they were operated when appropriate. And subsequently they were assessed for pulmonary functions and reflux at three months and nine months to assess what's happening to their reflux status and the pulmonary conditions. And this was a uh, quite uh, exhaustive study, but I just give only summary of these, uh, that all these patients of diaphragmatic hernia who presented within six hours with distress. So their management plan was, uh, who could be, uh, could be stabilized, were operated and survived. 28 um, uh, out of 37. And all those who could not be stabilized, and they all died, included four. So out of 30, uh, 41, four died, and 31 survived. And uh, 28, uh, 37 were uh, operated upon. And out of these, uh, 28 uh, survived about 70%. So all these were uh, unselected patients and they presented within six hours with respiratory distress. And uh, they had the 24 hour pH monitoring uh, during follow up. Uh, and it was categorized mild, moderate, severe, the, uh, depending on uh, how much time, five to 7% of the time, eight to 10%, and more than 10%. So this was considered a severe. Uh, uh, reflux and all of them were managed uh, with medical therapy. Uh, surgery was not undertaken till this study was complete. And uh, this shows uh, that uh, CDH, uh, sorry, yes. Uh, so, diaphragmatic, uh, these uh, hernia patients with reflux 24 out of 41 who survived. The reflux uh, was present in 12 of 24. And this shows that uh, there was no reflux in remaining 50%. Uh, percent. 
but mild, moderate, and severe, uh, the moderate reflux was in 25%. Uh, this is at three months. When they were studied at nine months, uh, the reflux has reduced. Uh, no reflux in 88% cases. So it means the reflux in the course of time with the passage of time in all these patients with diaph uh, diaphragmatic hernia operated upon, only 12% had the reflux at uh, nine months of follow-up. So the reflux was present in three of the 24 and only one was symptomatic. Uh, while seven were symptomatic uh, at three months. So the message is that with waiting and watching, not only the reflux has reduced uh, in incidence, but also the uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, at the same time, we did the pulmonary function test in these patients and uh, uh, that uh, almost 10% uh, improvement was seen in the pulmonary uh, ventilation perfusion scans, uh, say in 12 patients um, at, at nine months follow-up, if the reflux was not present. So significant improvement takes place uh, in the lung functions if no reflux is present. But yes, only 2% improvement takes place in the lung functions in diaphragmatic area patients uh, at nine months if the reflux was present. So reflux is damaging to the lungs also, and uh, uh, that has to be treated in such patients. So the summary is that reflux in CDH is uh, quite high. And possibly it is due to the absence of weak crust in these cases, and also the stretching of the hydrus while repairing the diaphragmatic defect. And that is responsible for causing reflux. Higher the reflux, and if the CDH required ECMO, means more severe the pathology and more chances of the reflux. But good part is that symptoms resolved in almost 85% of the cases uh, during follow-up at nine months in our study and uh, improvement by medical therapy is al almost in three-fourths of these cases and remaining only would require uh, surgery. So the conclusion is that reflux is common after CDH repair and the reflux reduces significantly at nine months follow. -up. Reflux is associated with presence of the thoracic stomach and delayed expansion of the lung. The pulmonary functions are poor on the affected side uh, and pulmonary functions improve during follow-up after the resolution of the reflux. So reflux has to be managed medically or surgically. Uh, this is my last slide and uh, needless to say that post of uh, reflux is common. Uh, almost uh, three-fourths of these patients, they develop reflux after any type of procedure in TOF patients, and it needs to be treated first by medical treatment and then, of course, by surgery uh, to prevent complications. Uh, so this requires investigation and early detection of the reflux if they are heavy and first manage with the medical therapy and then if symptomatic they are then of course surgery and we prefer thal uh, incomplete trap uh, to avoid the complete trap by nissen and uh, we have uh, less experience with the other technique uh, only few with uh, nissen and few with uh, uh, tope uh, but uh, our experience is also very limited uh, with uh, neurologically uh, inflicted patients, uh, very few cases. And uh, I remember a child, a pediatrician's uh, son, who was uh, having a lot of symptoms because of the reflux. And we gave a lot of trial with medical therapy. And at the age of three, when he did not respond and it was a problem to uh, rear the child, uh, 
we resorted to a surgical technique. And specifically, we did not consider Nissan in such a case because uh, he was already deranged and in case it is a complete trap and he develops more symptoms uh, like obstruction, bloating, and it will be very difficult to understand and evaluate uh, the symptoms. So we did only partial wrap and uh, he did quite well for a year or so, but again, he developed the symptoms. We investigated and we found that uh, the wrap has already uh, become uh, undone. Uh, so I think there is something much different in neurologically uh, inflicted patients. Uh, why? the wrap uh, uh, becomes loose and uh, it disappears. Uh, is it uh, because of the muscular activity? Is it because of the uh, deficient central control uh, or something else? So I think uh, we fully agree that neurologically deficient patients are different and uh, the chances of the failure of the wrap are quite high. Uh, I don't have much experience about the redo cases except in one uh, where I did and um, it was considered okay. So I can't comment more on redo cases with high incidence. Whenever there has been a failure of the rep, uh, our approach has been just to depend on the medical therapy to continue it uh, for long rather than resorting to surgical intervention. Uh, if there are questions, I will be happy to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Devrenda. I think it's better to move uh, to Guantavar and then to do the discussion and then there were similar topic and uh, there are many aspects to be discussed. It was really a wonderful lecture with a lot Thank you. Uh, of key points uh, regard, for example, how long we can do the medical treatment which are the adverse effects of this, but also there are a lot, a lot of things that I have noted during your presentation. Juan? Thank so you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you. 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 Thank you, Joanna. I am happy to see that you are able to manage my <laughs> presentation, <laughs> and I hope that I will be able to, to work with that. Uh, I don't certainly, know. Certainly, you will be able to. You see my pointer or you don't see my pointer? No. Uh, no, but uh, I am able to see very well uh, you. Oh, yes, yes, I have seen your point. Uh, oh, no, it, this, uh, uh, you don't see mine. Okay, no, no problem okay. with that. Okay. <laughs> I am happy, uh, anyways, that uh, uh, Devendra spoke before me because, in fact, our two presentations are complementary uh, as regards the esophageal atresia patients with gastroesophageal reflux. I want to uh, show you in my talk a few. Uh, uh, simple facts to point out some of the uh, less known aspects of gastroesophageal reflux in this particular uh, population of patients operated upon for esophageal atresia at birth. Can I have the next slide, please? The facts are that reflux is very frequent in survivors to esophageal atresia, that it can involve very serious issues that we will mention a little later, that often requires, as you know, and you have heard from Devendra as well, surgical treatment, and also that the anti-reflux operations fail quite often, as was already pointed out by Paolo and also by Devendra. So, next slide. <clears throat> if you take uh, uh, some studies over the long-term outcomes of patients with esophageal atresia, the doctoral dissertation by Sarah Sistonen from Helsinki is a very good uh, uh, document where you can see a number of series of, uh, long, of patients followed up for a long period of time after operations for esophageal atresia. And you see here see a number of series, a total of uh, uh, 200, uh, a number of, of, of patients, 260 patients, and you see that about, next slide, I think, next, uh, yeah, you have 47% of these patients had symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux, much more important, esophagitis, as uh, detected by histology, was present in 64% of patients, 
and varied esophagus was present in 7% of these patients. So uh, this is something that it's alarming uh, and uh, you can see that the long-term presence of reflux is a regular, is a usual thing in patients with operated upon for esophageal atresia. Next slide. <clears throat> and uh, in the same uh, uh, doctoral dissertation, uh, uh, Sarah took uh, all the survivors from Helsinki uh, from 1945 to 1985, and uh, she included more than 100 uh, with a mean age of uh, 36 years. And she could uh, show that 34% had reflux, that 25% had esophagitis, and that 21% had barred esophagus. Again, a very concerning uh, evidence. Next slide, please. When I talk about serious issues, I'm talking, of course, not only about the recurrence or the persistence of the symptoms, but I'm talking about the uh, increasing presence of uh, barrett esophagus, dysplasia, and eventually cancer. Next slide. This is a uh, uh, article, recent article, by uh, uh, a group in France, in Lille, that was uh, 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 directed by a very relevant uh, esophageal investigator, Dr. Gotland, and you can see that uh, wallet esophagus and in adolescents and young adults with esophageal atresia, taking a lot of series, some of them have been quoted already by me, but some more are here, you see that uh, an important proportion of these patients had esophagitis, ranging from 50 to 75 percent, 25 to 75 percent, and metaplasia, that, that's barred esophagus, was present in a variable uh, proportion of the patients, but range, ranging from uh, 6 percent to 36 percent. So important proportion of these patients had barred esophagus. Next slide. And this article that you all know, that was published by uh, uh, people in, in Australia it was the first to uh, show that in a series of 309 patients with esophageal atresia, four developed uh, squamous uh, cell cancer of the esophagus uh, uh, about at the age of uh, 40 years. And if you put this proportion in, in comparison with the general population, you can see that the cumulative incident of esophageal cancer in this age group was 50 times more than expected. So that means if we have reflux, we have barrett, and we have cancer, although in small proportions, if you take this period of time, probably if you wait 40 years more, you will have many more. That means that we are facing a quite serious problem, a quite important issue that we have to try to prevent or to solve if we can. Next slide. The fact that it often requires surgical treatment is very well known by you, and it has been already shown by all by Paolo and also by, by, by Devendra. Next slide. I only will show you uh, a cumulative uh, 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 collective series, series, different series that were collected by uh, Ana Catarina Fragoso and myself a few years ago to show you that the proportion of uh, reflux in patients with uh, esophageal atresia, taking all the series that you see on the left side, it was 42.7% altogether, taking a number of patients, no, previous, previous, uh, no. well, you see that uh, out of uh, uh, 1,600 um, patients we, uh, operated upon for esophageal atresia, 42% had reflux, and 46% of these had to be operated upon for reflux. So surgery is frequent after uh, esophageal atresia, uh, not, esophageal atresia survivors. Next slide, please. And uh, it is also known that uh, the anti-reflux operations often fail, and it has been again stressed also by, by Paolo and also by Devendra. Next slide. Uh, an old series from uh, Snyder and uh, other authors showed that uh, uh, the failures of fund application in individuals with esophageal atresia range from 
15% to 36%. So you see that the percentage of failures was important. And the next slide. In our study uh, uh, with uh, Ana Catalina Fragoso, we reviewed the same thing and you, we showed that uh, with uh, uh, 3,000 fund applications all combined, 7% uh, had to have a review. But if you restrict the, uh, uh, these figures to, to individuals with uh, esophageal atresia, the proportion of redo fund application was 18.1% in a number of series along the years, as I, it's shown here. Next slide, please. Why all this happens? Well, the, the serious issues, uh, the uh, uh, need for, for fund application and the bad results of fund application. Well, the first thing is that the anatomy is distorted. Next slide. You know this very well. All of you have been confronted with operations in this uh, uh, gastroesophageal region in patients with esophageal atresia. And you are familiar with this fact that the esophagus is shorter. Uh, the intraabdominal esophagus is shorter. The fundus is small. There is no angle of his and often the stomach is small. And here, this picture shows you one of the reasons why operations are more difficult or probably less good in these patients than in regular patients where you have an angle of his, and you have uh, some uh, intra-abdominal esophagus and a large stomach. Next slide. This is the usual picture uh, uh, after uh, operation in a patient with esophageal atresia, and that depicts exactly what I have shown in the prior picture. Next slide. Tension is an issue, and I'm going to uh, insist a little bit on that because it's something that sometimes we disregard. Next slide. Uh, we try to show that in uh, an animal experiment that uh, has been published a long time ago, but I will go through that again. Uh, on the left, you have uh, the gastroesophageal uh, barrier in a human, and in the right, you have one in the rat. Uh, the difference in both, are, they are quite, quite similar, but in fact, the main difference is that in the man, uh, both components of the barrier, the pleural sling and the lower sphincter, that's the high pressure zone in the lower esophagus, are superimposed, whether, whereas in, in the rat, they are separated upon and uh, they, they are separated and then can be detected separately, as I will show you. Next slide. <clears throat> you can perform in the rat a pull-through manometry, as I show in this uh, uh, picture and you see that withdrawing the probe uh, through the gastroesophageal uh, valve, uh, gastroesophageal uh, barrier, you can see that uh, you have deflections uh, that correspond to the stomach, then you have a plateau that corresponds to the lower esophageal sphincter, then you have again some uh, deflections, intraabdominal pressures that correspond to the intraabdominal uh, esophagus, and then you have the fascic uh, contractions of the diaphragm, which compose the uh, diaphragmatic sling, second component of the anti reflux barrier. And then you see in the tracing the negative deflections of uh, the pressure within the thorax, which is negative. Next. Using this technique with Sandra Montedonigo when she was a fellow in our place long, a number of years ago, we decided to perform either a transection of the esophagus or a resection of the esophagus in order to shorten the esophagus and to produce a high tension on the gastroesophageal region. Next slide. And then we perform in both groups, transection and resection, a uh, pull-through manometry in the way I have shown you. Next slide. And uh, I'm not going to go very much into that, but you see in the uh, upper part the transaction uh, group and the lower part the resection group. And you see that the preoperative tracing is exactly as I have shown you in my, in my picture before. You have first the lower esophageal sphincter pressure, then you have the fussy contractions of the stomach, of the uh, diaphragm, and then you have negative deflections in the thorax. And you see that at, after transaction, the 
pattern is identical, nothing changed. Whereas after the resection and uh, after putting the esophagus under tension, the lower esophageal expected pressure plateau is totally abolished, whereas the um, cruel link pressure remains there. So that means that tension changes something in the barrier. Next slide. And uh, uh, this has been already mentioned by, uh, by the Vendra, but take, I take again the meta-analysis by uh, Florian Friedmacher and Fren Puri, who took uh, 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 in their meta-analysis uh, 44 studies of patients treated with uh, uh, delayed primary anastomosis, that means with uh, ten, some degree of tension always. And I call your attention mainly on the fact that they had a number of strictures, they had symptomatic reflux, they have esophagitis in a high proportion, but particularly that they have almost one out of six had barrett metaplasia after the, the uh, uh, repair. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, this comes from Fokker himself. Uh, from uh, this is he published in, 19, in two thousand and nine the first series of uh, the so-called growth procedure uh, for long gap esophageal atresia, and uh, forty two of his patients were follow up for more than three years. And uh, you have to recall that one hundred percent required dilatations, that one hundred percent required a nissen, and that twenty eight percent required a second nissen. So. Tension probably involves something that makes reflux much worse in patients with esophageal atresia. Next slide. And again, I come to uh, uh, the study by the, the group in Lille, the French group in Lille, and this is the prevalence of Barrett esophagus in adolescents and young adults with esophageal atresia. And I want to call your attention only about one fact, is that uh, look at the uh, left column and you can see here that the type of esophageal atresia type one that's uh, uh, pure esophageal atresia without fistula and type three that's regular uh, type of esophageal atresia next slide and you can see that uh, uh, out of a population of 120 patients uh, with uh, Barrett, uh, uh, studied uh, for Barrett esophagus you can see that the Barrett positive patients, 83% were type one, 41% were type three. And the Barrett esophagus negative, the proportion were, was inverse. So that means that uh, the larger the, 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 the tension, the more important the tension, the more frequent is Barrett esophagus and probably the problems with uh, uh, reflux. Next slide. The second thing is bad peristalsis. This is something that uh, we all know as well, because uh, obviously patients with esophageal atresia have a not normal esophagus, but I'm going to insist a little bit, a little bit little on that. Next slide. You remember that of course, peristalsis uh, is related to the presence of extrinsic, extrinsic innervation, where the vagus nerves in the lower esophagus and by the recurrent laryngeal nerves on the upper esophagus. And then on the two plexuses that are in between both uh, muscle layers and in between the submucosal and the internal layer of uh, the wall of the esophagus. And uh, uh, peristal peristalsis is uh, coordinated by this network, ne neural network and makes the pro uh, effects the propulsion of the volus along the esophagus in a craniocaudal direction in a normal individual. Next slide. Professor Michael Davis from South Africa had the opportunity to demo to, to dissect uh, a number of specimens of non-operated patients with esophageal atresia. And he could describe that the uh, extrinsic uh, innervation of the esophagus was not normal in these individuals, particularly by the abnormal the, uh, arrangement of the vagus nerves and also sometimes by the absence of the or the small size of the vagus nerves. Next slide. His findings, findings were confirmed in the uh, experimental model of esophageal atresia by our former uh, 
uh, associate Dr. Bao Chan Chi when he was working in, in Melbourne later on. And he could show that in this adriamycin model of esophageal atresia, both the vagus nerves and the laryngeal nerves were not normal in rats with esophageal atresia, showing the same thing as Professor Davis had shown in uh, individual in human individuals with the atresia. Next slide. In uh, Ben Landing's laboratory in uh, uh, the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles back in 86, uh, they had the opportunity to study a few specimens of uh, non-operated esophageal atresias, uh, and they could demonstrate that the density of the ganglia was uh, decreased in the fistula, in the lower part of the esophagus, and that the upper part of the esophagus had massive uh, uh, ganglia, big nerves, big ganglia that were different from the uh, uh, normal ones. Next slide, please. Next slide. The next slide. Oh, the diapositiva. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we could go with Federica Pederiva, who is Federiva, who is uh, attending this meeting when she was. Uh, of a fellow in our place, we could repeat uh, these experiments in individuals who had type one, that's pure esophageal atresia, uh, that were had replacement of the esophagus uh, by colon. And so we could have specimens from the upper pouch and from the lower pouch. And we could study the neural network inside the esophagus. Next slide. And with uh, stainings for the ganglia, we could show in the left, you have the control individuals, and in the right, you have pure esophageal atresia individual. We, can confirm, we could confirm what Nakazato had described prior in a type three esophageal atresia patients. Next slide. So innervation is abnormal. There is no question about that. But uh, uh, does, that, does this have any translation in the clinical arena? Well, this is an old study we used at that time ambulatory manometry that was not available to everybody at the time, but the study remains uh, valid because in fact, we could demonstrate that the motility of the esophagus in individuals with esophageal atresia was roughly abnormal. Next slide, please. I only show you uh, the uh, proportion of peristaltic sequences that were detected along the day uh, in these individuals with esophageal atresia. And you have in red, you have a negative control with achalasia. We use five patients with achalasia. In green, you have individuals with gastroesophageal reflux that had roughly a quite normal uh, peristaltic proportion of sequences, 80% in 24 hours and a little more during meals. And in yellow, you have 25 patients with esophageal atresia you can appreciate that the proportion of peristaltic waves was below 50%, both along the 24 hours and during meals, showing that the uh, uh, motility of the esophagus was very bad. Next slide. And I only show you a, a, a tracing, but you can see up in the upper part of the tracing, you have the esophageal pH, and uh, then you have three different levels of manometry, upper, middle, and lower esophagus, and you have a a uh, quite longer period of time uh, uh, selected from a 24 hour tracing. And you can see that at the beginning, you can see that this patient had a, an episode of cough that it's detected by the increase, uh, 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 sudden increase of pressure simultaneous at three levels of the esophagus. That means that the patient had cough and that triggers an episode of uh, reflux that can be seen in the pH uh, in the upper tracing, you see that immediately the pH be, falls below four, which is the, the dot line that you can see there. And you see that uh, this episode of reflux lasted at least the 16 minutes that I'm showing in the, in the slide, but probably much more, mainly because there were no peristaltic contractions at the three levels of the esophagus, showing that the function of the esophagus was in this particular case very bad. Next slide. This is something that may seem a, a little apart from uh, the question, but it's not 
not so apart. You see, if uh, the airway has some influence on the on, on the generation of reflux, uh, you know that patients with esophageal atresia have often uh, uh, tracheomalacia, and also that uh, in the long term, many of them have respiratory disease that is uh, uh, particularly frequent of the obstructive type, and that means that they have some degree of airway obstruction. Not only that, we have studied that only also uh, uh, the, the respiratory tract as a part of the malformation. Next slide, please. In a study that we performed also with Sandra Montedonico uh, back in 1999, she reviewed the uh, uh, files of uh, uh, 415 patients with esophageal atresia at that time, and uh, we could see that uh, 6% of them had uh, malformations of the uh, respiratory tract. And uh, the fact that uh, she studied a high number of autopsies, 129 is a historical series where there were, was a lot of, uh, of, malform of mortality and a high rate of autopsies. You can see that uh, the proportion in autopsies was 13% of patients with esophageal atresia and the nature of the malformations were, next slide, variable from long hypoplasia or absence uh, to uh, anomalies in the lobulation, stenosis of the airway at different levels and uh, abnormal tracheal bronchi as it's very well known. Next slide. Following this study, Dr. Usui from uh, Professor Sokada uh, University in, 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 uh, in Osaka showed that uh, the number of uh, anomalies of the tracheobronchial tree was quite high in individuals with esophageal atresia, and some of them had either tracheal webs or congenital bronchial stenosis or congenital tracheal stenosis that may influence the presence of reflux. Next slide. In our model of esophageal atresia in rats, we could show as well that uh, uh, many of these animals had abnormal tracheal rings showing that the development of the respiratory tract was abnormal in animals and also in humans with uh, esophageal atresia. Next slide. And we performed a, a, a very easy uh, experiment. We uh, induced uh, tracheal stenosis by introducing in the trachea of the rats uh, tubes with different uh, uh, lumen, lumina. And you can see that in the right one, that's a maximum uh, restriction of the airway, that's a high uh, uh, stenosis of the airway. And then we studied the pressures. Next slide. You see a normal tracing that reproduce what I have shown you before. And then you have uh, under severe uh, airway obstruction, you can see that uh, on the right of the, of the uh, tracing, you see that the negative deflections that correspond to the uh, placement of the uh, probe in, in the thorax show a very intense negative pressure in that part of uh, the anatomy of the rat. Next slide. Uh, if you compare the abdominal pressure and the thoracic pressure, you can uh, the, uh, trace a gradient. Next slide. And you can see with the obstruction, when the obstruction uh, goes up, the uh, gradient goes up until equaling the lowest of all the pressure causing reflux. So respiratory tract disease can produce, can facilitate, and can make more uh, severe gastroesophageal reflux. And this is something that should be taken into account. Next slide, please. And then you have to take into account that all these factors are permanent. And as I told you before, when I was discussing Paulo's uh, talk, uh, we can create uh, a competent valve. We can eventually create a competent valve that lasts for a long time. But we cannot change all the other factors. And all the other factors remain active in these patients for life, many of them for life. That means that uh, uh, the explanation of uh, the high rate of failure of uh, the treatments for, um, gastro for gastroesophageal reflux in patients with esophageal atresia is very, very explained, explained by the permanence of all these and tower factors that are present in them. Next slide. And I can conclude 
that the problem of gastroesophageal reflux in patients surviving esophageal atresia is far from being solved. And that's why we are discussing that today. Next slide, final slide. And I always put all the fellows that contributed to the uh, investigation, to the research on esophageal atresia in our lab. You see people from many countries, and some of them made the uh, crucial contributions to the understanding of this uh, particular uh, aspect of uh, gastroesophageal uh, uh, conditions. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can take out the... Yeah, thank okay. you, thank you, uh, Juan. It was really a, a super uh, presentation. Anyway, we know your interest in this field, and all the research, uh, work that you did in the past. I am very happy to see two Italian ladies, a surgeon, woman surgeon, Lucia and Federica. That means that in your department, uh, woman surgeon, uh, I had the chance have to have been uh, well accepted, have been well accepted. But uh, I have seen that there was other, many other uh, women uh, scientists uh, with you. So uh, I, uh, the discussion is open to the floor. Adrian has something to say, please, Adrian. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Devendra. Excellent presentations and very thought provoking. Um, I want to ask you both um, a, a basic question. So you've told us that reflux is very common and that it has serious consequences. Um, how often would you suggest that one follows up these patients with what? How often do you give them an anesthetic for endoscopy, for example? And the second question along with that is when you see um, uh, eosinophilia and particularly uh, uh, Barrett's esophagus, metaplasia, what do you do about it? Thank you. Uh -huh. Go on. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Devendra. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Indian, uh, for the very nice uh, um, questions. Uh, both are relevant. First thing, uh, all these patients who have been uh, diagnosed with reflux, whether medical or uh, requiring surgery, they need uh, certainly a regular follow-up. And uh, fortunately, uh, follow-up, uh, there is no definite criteria, but all those who are following the medical treatment at least for a couple of years till their symptoms uh, are under control. And usually it takes about two years or three years uh, when they grow up, when uh, the lower esophageal sphincter possibly becomes mature, and uh, that uh, the patient himself, herself can manage these symptoms uh, due to reflux. And then the medical therapy will stop. So it is a symptom-based uh, therapy, medical therapy. But yes, surgical therapy who are more serious and especially in our setup, the respiratory symptoms associated with reflux confirmed on imaging, having a uh, gross reflux at the lower end and also where the angle is not acute as shown by Wantoa. So these are the candidates, you put them into more serious management and that is search. So that is one part. Second one, how frequently to evaluate them? Again, there is no definite criteria. But uh, certainly it's age-related. All those patients who have been treated in the past, either medically or surgically, they need endoscopic uh, evaluation, especially after 10 years of um, surgery. And that is the time one would like to take a biopsy at the uh, gastroesophageal junction. And in case there is a, a change in the uh, biopsy, uh, uh, then these are the cases 
who require and possibly uh, after repeat endoscopic procedures a uh, treatment akin to a ca at the lower end of the esophagus would require to be managed but because the overall experience with this problem and pathology is very limited at the moment a very drastic intervention requiring resection and anastomosis possibly will not be uh, justified but yes pediatricians are very keen to take the biopsy and follow them up for is for eosinophilic esophagitis which is different than the barrett's which is different and uh, these are the cases who don't have uh, good motility and uh, in one case uh, we did the esophageal replacement uh, because the motility was problem lumen was there and uh, the drooling or the reflux was a serious issue so uh, it's it's a different kind of management uh, esophenic uh, esophagitis uh, but the other cases with metaplasic changes uh, certainly requires more robust and more frequent monitoring and as the progress is made and if metaplasia changes continue then the treatment will be uh, resection and uh, alternative uh, procedures yeah thank you thank you very much Adrian, for your question uh, i basically agree with what the vendor had said in fact you asked uh, uh, how often do we control the patients in, uh, for that? We follow up all our esophageal atresia patients until adult age, and we pass them to the gastroenterological teams in, the, in, in adults after that age. At least once a year we see them, and, or we have contact with them. And uh, the, uh, I, I won't, won't advise uh, endoscopy uh, until... Uh, unless the patient is severely um, symptomatic, unless the adolescent age, because I don't think we cannot change very much uh, what happens before. But after that age, I think at least a uh, endoscopy and biopsy every uh, fifth year or something like that will be uh, uh, advised. And probably we should be follow up for life uh, uh, when they have metaplasia, particularly when they have intestinal metaplasia. And then the other question was, what do we do when we find one of these uh, biopsies that is uh, uh, concerning a uh, serious issue, as I said? Well, if the patient is uh, symptomatic for reflux and we detect uh, uh, dysplasia, then we advise uh, surgical treatment. Uh, but we don't know whether this is uh, something that uh, changes anything, as you know very well, because maybe that we don't change that very much. But anyway, we, we advise uh, surgery in that cases. And uh, we don't have any other way of treating that, as you know. Uh, uh, in endoscopic uh, ablation uh, is not developed in uh, youngsters, as you know. And I don't think we can do any other thing that advising uh, close follow-up of these patients for life. Even if they are uh, roughly asymptomatic, I think they need follow-up for life. Okay. Uh, can I add, uh, Indian, uh, to this aspect? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm, this intestinal metaplasia is of a greater concern in, in those patients who have the gastric pull-up because there is a biliary gastritis because of the duodenogastric reflux, and that is a serious challenge in all those patients. Uh, who had uh, undergone the gastric pull-up uh, and having this reflux. Uh, we have 66 patients of gastric pull-up and 49 of these were because of the uh, wide gap uh, esophageal atresia. Uh, and we followed them up uh, with the uh, various uh, investigations uh, blood test, uh, pulmonary function test, uh, height, weight, and uh, but specifically for the duodenogastric reflux and clearance studies uh, with nuclear scan and imaging and HIDA scanning for duodenogastric reflux. Uh, almost two-thirds of these had uh, the reflux positive 
Uh, and when we took the biopsy from the gastric mucosa, uh, uh, only 10% uh, had shown changes uh, akin to gastritis, but not of intestinal met metaplasia. And this is uh, five years after their gastric pull-up was done, uh, spanning on to seven years or 7.6 years. But mean time five years post gastric pull up showing only gastritis in about 10% uh, cases uh, and but no intestinal metaplasia uh, meaning thereby that this remains a concern and a need for lifelong follow up uh, specifically in patients with duodenal gastric reflux in gastric pull up patients okay thank you very much for that um, so I understand that follow-up should be at least once a year with endoscopy, particularly after adolescence, yes? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Uh, yes. so what I'm not clear on is when you see metaplasia, Juan said you do surgery. Okay, what sort of surgery? And then we have the vendor come along and say, if you do a gastric pull-up and there's metaplasia, it's very serious. Yes, okay. What do you do about it? Do you go and remove the stomach? T tell us a little more detail, if I can put you, you on the spot. Yes, uh, okay. When we talk of metaplasia, it is happening in the esophagus, not in the stomach. Of course. Okay. With, because of the reflux, the biopsy is from esophagus. It's happening at the gastroesophageal junction. So if it is confirmed, if it is happening, if it is increasing, and normally it should not happen certainly uh, before 10, 15 years. It has to be after that year uh, with a follow-up. Uh, at that situation, certainly there will be a need, not that I have any experience even to have the case of a intestinal metaplasia. But yes, hypothetically, if it happens, I will be seriously concerned to take care of it right in the beginning when biopsy has confirmed it is an intestinal metaplasia. All right, remove that segment of the esophagus and uh, anastomosis uh, with an alternative. There would be then uh, options considered depending on what it is, where it is. Uh, so how much esophagus and stomach to be resected, which part, and then you have the possibility to uh, either use a gastric tube uh, if it is away from that area or to use the jejunum as a bypass. So my side. It's, uh, please, uh, one. Very shortly on my side. Uh, when I said uh, surgery, well, I mean, if, if we see that and the patient is symptomatic, I offered surgery. Surgery means, in this case, only anti-reflux surgery. So I have no uh, offer for a resection or a, a intraluminal ablation or something like that. And also, uh, the important thing is that we have to uh, enhance our control of the uh, metaplasia uh, because of the risk of cancer. But that doesn't mean that metaplasia is cancer all the time, as you know. And uh, many people, we only l l follow up these patients by uh, relatively frequent endoscopies and biopsies to see if there is something uh, progressive in the metaplasia. But most patients probably won't have cancer. So we try to fight the reflux that certainly uh, uh, plays a role in these, and if we can't control reflux, maybe we do something. But I agree with you. In fact, we are not doing something directly useful for the metaplasia. Uh, there was a comment from uh, Martin Lacker. Martin, can yeah. you hear me? Then I will say something. Yes, I, I, I follow your discussion on this, uh, Barrett, um, with great interest. So in Germany, we are following there's a German guideline and the European NASPEN guide guideline, which distinguish between low grade dysplasia and high grade dysplasia. Yeah. If you ha have low grade dysplasia, they recommend endoscopy after six months. And if you reconfirm there to do a radio ablation of that dysplasia. 
if it's macroscopically visible, then they recommend endoscopic resection. And if it's high grade dysplasia, they recommend endoscopic sub or mucosa resection. At the same time, in that guideline, it's an Aspen Aspen guideline, and the JBGN published in uh, 2016. They said it's there is no report on a deno carcinoma or uh, even that squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus after EA. But this is what what we do. I mean, this is the long term, and at that time, the children are big enough <laughs> that the adult surgeons or the adult gastroenterologists who have like the most experience with this submucosal resection, dis dissection, they are doing it. But there's, to my knowledge, oh. no indication to really resect that sex segment surgically. I want to add something to what uh, Martin said uh, uh, now. So I, uh, it's the same in Italy for the adult gastroenterology. First of all, they have new instrument that permit to visualize also very well the degree of intestinal metaplasia at endoscopic examination. So they, they uh, compare this aspect with the result of the biopsy. And then when there is a barret uh, the, or a very severe metaplasia, they used to do an endoscopic causal resection. So this is the new way to treat. But if you look back to the technique, I think we have to think that also when we perform some type of reconstruction, I think we have to avoid the type of reconstruction that can maintain uh, reflux. For example, the Collins procedure, the Charlie also. Charlie was an eminent uh, pediatric surgeon and I enjoyed to listen from him several times, but I think that this kind of operation uh, maintain a severe reflux uh, in the esophageal stump because the anastomosis is made inside the thorax. It's a little different for gastric pull-up. If the gastric pull-up is well done and the anastomosis is at the level of the neck, the uh, recurrence of reflux is very low. And in my personal experience, I have a patient with uh, more than 10 years follow-up and they have no reflux, but the anastomosis is well-placed. Also, this aspect was learned by me by Annie Cohen that I have to thank for all his uh, support. But uh, also Louis Pitts uh, underlined a lot the importance to put anastomosis in the neck and not in the thorax because it's a problem of pressure that maintain the reflux. So I think looking back to the, the experience after uh, several decades of experience in esophageal reconstruction, we have to think to this, uh, to this aspect. And I have also another question for the two, uh, especially for the Brenda, when uh, he, he, he speak, he, he have, uh, you have underlined the importance of a medical therapy and of, of waiting about the spontaneous resolution of the reflux. And this is certainly a proper um, uh, way, but uh, I want to know how long do you suggest it's uh, advisable a PPI therapy in these patients? Uh, yes, again, a good question. As I uh, mentioned that medical therapy remains the uh, uh, cornerstone to manage uh, the symptoms. And usually six months to two years is the time that most of these patients will settle down um, under medical therapy with all the symptoms. And if the symptoms are really severe and not manageable with this, including adding domperidone, we try to avoid cisapred in most of the cases, but if to be given as a last resort, not to be given more than three months, six months at the most because of the serious side effect. So uh, PIP alternating with renitidine, uh, adding with domperidone, and finally cisapride uh, as uh, alternative ones, six months to uh, two years. And if the symptoms persist at two years, better to go ahead for surgical intervention. 
Yeah, on my side, I am less confident on medications than you are, uh, Devendra. And uh, uh, I agree that probably using PPIs is um, wise uh, in the first periods after the operation. But there is a Cochrane study, I don't have the, the, the reference here, that shows that in fact that didn't change anything. I mean, so probably it's not necessary to give PPIs of patients like that with, with esophageal atresia. And of course, uh, leave aside, Cisapride has been abandoned, and not only because uh, there was some cardiac risk, but also because it was demonstrated that there was of no use, in fact, it was a huge business, but no, of no great use. And uh, uh, I think we don't have many medications that uh, are good for this particular set, uh, clinical set and setting. And uh, I think that what we need is to think about uh, reflux, and to look for it when it is required and to follow it up when it is present, yeah. And sometimes to correct it surgically when uh, there is no way of doing otherwise. And uh, if I can make a comment on that, on the technique, because uh, Devendra showed that uh, he prefers the tal fund application. The anatomy of uh, the stomach and the esophagus in patients with esophageal atresia it's not very good for tal operation because we don't have a, a fundus. It's very conic, conic shaped, and not, not very good for that. And uh, also, if you look, uh, I think it is interesting that if you look at the original places where these operations were uh, proposed, Kansas City and also Barcelona were with the same uh, variation of the tal operation. In fact, since the laparoscopic surgery appeared, they moved into Nissen fund application for all these patients and eventually for some of them for to pay a fund application, but they abandoned the TAL fund application for patients with esophageal atresia. And in my mind, it makes sense. I mean, you need, uh, you know, the gold standard operation for this particular case in which all the components of the reflux are, pr are present and permanent and uh, they threaten the esophagus clearly. Okay, thank you. I have to say that I agree with uh, Gwen. In my personal experience, when I had the recurrence after a uh, CAL procedure in uh, esophageal atresia patient, uh, so I, uh, the only recurrence I had using TAL. And generally, I, I moved completely to Nissen for the application with better results. I think the anatomy is really not. Uh, favorable in, uh, in uh, esophageal atresia patients, in my opinion. Maybe I am not so expert, but this was my personal experience. The situation comes, uh, Joanna, that uh, if you start doing one procedure and you find that, yes, this, this has been your experience and practice, so you continue doing that procedure. Uh, certainly the other uh, surgeons have their own uh, approach and experience, so they prefer that too, to do that. that. But uh, I, I agree with uh, Juan that uh, Tupé is also uh, quite uh, uh, easier and uh, to do. But my point was, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, we have been doing uh, this procedure more extensively than doing just a floppy Nissen and putting three stitches around the uh, esophagus. I think uh, uh, Taking the stomach right up to uh, the diaphragm, mobilizing the uh, esophagophrenic uh, 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 ligament and making a real U shape with sutures, uh, five, six sutures on the left side, five, six on the right side and three, four, five on the top. So this really makes it quite um, extensive. Uh, operation and then of course closing the crust right and left uh, nicely under vision and all I have been doing with open surgery. Uh, so that has been my approach. Possibly you just uh, uh, remained uh, stick to one approach that you have been doing in the past and with no regrets. Thank you. Thank you Devrenda. Any other, any other question from the floor? So I think uh, we may move uh, at the end of this morning to um, Valerio Gentilino 
for question time, Valerio. Okay, are they? Okay. Buongiorno, good morning, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today's question time that basically has been divided in two slots. One Valerio, more... Valerio, if you, Valerio, yes, uh, you have to... yeah, the mode presentation mode, please. Sure. It's not full screen. You have to put in full screen. Okay. It's yeah. perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. So I was saying that uh, basically we divided the question time in two slots, so one this morning and one this afternoon. Uh, we actually change it a little bit. So in order to get uh, our junior people as much involved as possible, we asked them to create uh, nine clinical scenarios uh, in order to open the discussion. I think... Uh, I and they should be honored today to have you as a discussant. On the other hand, I, I ask, I kindly ask our honorable president and discussant to give our junior people a feedback, a commenting the vote that we are going to see uh, just now. So please, uh, Professor Lima, if you uh, want to, we can start with the first question. So this is a three-year-old boy affected by cerebral palsy with a history of frequent regurgitation and growth retardation admitted to our department for an injustice pneumonia. What is your diagnostic workup in the suspicion of gastroesophageal reflux disease? Uh, upper GI, pH, uh, manometry, scintigraphy, and endoscopy. As above, without upper GI. Just pH uh, impedance monitoring and endoscopy or plus scintigraphy. Well, of course, this morning we have already touched many of these issues. Um, I stop it and I show you the results. Okay, most of us replied with A. Um, I didn't tell you that uh, probably there is only one uh, correct answer. Um, so I asked them to create a clinical scenario with uh, three or four uh, reasonable answers. So we can uh, open the discussion briefly, of course. Um, Probably some of us have got a different answer, uh, except for these four. Uh, for example, myself, I would have done pH impedance, uh, upper GI, and endoscopy. Any comment from the audience? Francesco Molinaro. Okay, thank you, Valerio. I think in this... Uh... Uh, in these questions, probably one of the problems for this patient is uh, the time uh, of avoiding uh, of the of the stomach. The, this is a problem. That probably it could be uh, detected and uh, diagnosed by a, a scintigraphy. And uh, this is a kind, a very particular kind of uh, of a baby, and uh, the. And the the, the the treatment choice is not so clear. Conduplication, uh, disconnection, uh, probably uh, if the degree of cerebral palsy is very severe with the uh, avoiding problem of, uh, uh, of the stomachs, the, the disconnection is a good choice and uh, detective the, the time of, uh, of avoiding on the stomach probably is could be a, a good a good option what, what what do you think about and what are the the opinion of the other well of course this is a probably another topic and issue uh, as you mentioned earlier clearly this question time uh, cannot cover all the aspects of the of the gastroesophageal reflux so 
I have to say they made a great effort to create these clinical scenarios. Uh, and uh, since we haven't got time enough to discuss deeply, uh, probably this is the, the right uh, answer, actually. We can move to the second if you want, Prof. So second scenario, a 13 year old girl affected by epileptic encephalopathy and severe malnutrition performs an upper GI series, which reveals a severe gastroesophageal reflux. What is your treatment of choice? Lap Nissen, Lap Nissen with gastrostomy, esophageal gastric dissociation, robot assisted Nissen fund duplication. I'm not sure if our young people are all connected to the meeting right now, but if so, please do not hesitate to reply to our senior discussant, Edu, Valeria, and Gabriela. So 77% uh, laparoscopic Nixon fund application with gastrostomy. As I said before, Professor De Copy and many uh, other honorable colleagues have already touched this issue today. Um, it is just a poll, of course, it's not a real discussion. I asked our seniors to make a comment on this uh, poll if they want. I am the live uh, Valerio. Shall I say something? In this case, I changed my opinion from the past and I moved it to esophageal gastric dissociation due to the complexity of the clinical uh, neurogenical attempt of the patient. So I think it's better to do it this way rather than to do a better made uh, Nissan uh, plus PEG and then to do the procedure and to have a lot of additional complications. I can see Edu connected is the author of the clinical scenario. Please, Edu, make a comment if you want. Yeah, I would like to ask... Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to ask a question to Professor Isaj Petitoni. And do you think, um, in your experience, is it difficult to convince parents to accept an esophagogastric dissociation as a first therapy? Yes, it's difficult. It's difficult as it's difficult sometimes to propose uh, a, a gastrostomy, a PEC, uh, because they want to maintain some degree of uh, feeding from the mouth. They, they think that uh, uh, the patient is able to eat from the mouth, even if uh, he has a frequent uh, airway infection and inhalation. So it's not easy. You have obviously to discuss. You have ob obviously to present uh, the argument in favor and against. And then uh, the final decision has to be taken, uh, I mean, in a completely accord. You can uh, uh, push uh, too much a solution uh, uh, toward another, but you have to explain the advantage of one related to the other. Uh, particularly for the child, because you know, each patient uh, may have different exercises, but it's difficult. It requires expertise, competence, and a good way to really of, uh, of relationship with the parents. Can I, can I just make one correction? There is, there is no problem at all with the patient eating orally as much as they can and they wish after a dissociation operation. So once you do a dissociation, what you are doing is you are not allowing reflux again, but there is no reason why the patient cannot eat orally if they can and if they want to, to whatever level that they wish. You also have a gastrostomy, uh, which you can supplement nutrition with 
um, to, to the level that is necessary because these patients cannot eat as much as they wish because they are neurologically abnormal. Do you, do you I, understand? No, I, I agree with you. I was just speaking about the difficulty to propose uh, this uh, pack at the same time, but you are right uh, with uh, the dissociation technique. Yeah. Quick comment from Prof Molinaro. I think in this, in this particular patient, uh, missing fund duplication has an high risk of a failure. And probably esophageal gas dissociation is the best choice. If uh, one time the problem was the fact that, that uh, this kind of procedure was not uh, a mini invasive procedure, now it is possible to perform that in a robotic surgery or laparoscopic surgery. It's, I know it, it, it's a uh, difficult procedure with uh, that needs probably a, an eye learning curve in this kind of. Uh, of a technique, but uh, you know, probably if this is possible. The the future. Thank you. I think we have to move to the third uh, clinical scenario. So this is a two-year-old boy treated for esophageal atresia, who has undergone multiple endoscopies with dilatation because of an stomatic stricture. What to do next? Change and reflux therapy and continue with endoscopy monitoring every two, four weeks. Uh, consider fund application, change and reflux therapy, and continue with endoscopy monitoring every two, four weeks. Uh, and consider fund application if persistence of symptoms. So basically, the question is uh, fund application straight ahead or monitoring and then uh, fund application. You see the results? No. Not yet, Prof. Yes, we do. 70 percent. Okay, you see? Okay. Yes, Prof. Yes, we do. Uh, and have choose change and reflux therapy and continue with endoscopy monitoring. And then it's a point application it's persistent of symptoms. Uh, any comment for from the audience? Uh, as I said, we already touched this issue with Prof. Tovar before. Um, I, can make, I can make a short comment. Please, uh, Prof. Uh, protracted strictures after esophageal anastomosis uh, may be related to reflux, and this was pointed out almost 50 years ago from the group of Boston, who showed that some of these strictures were not correct, not, were not uh, able to be dilated until they stop the reflux part from the application. And this has been studied again years later from another center in Boston as well. And also in recent years, uh, the idea is uh, less strict about that. In my personal experience, I have to say that uh, uh, I am convinced that uh, some of these stenosis are related to reflux and, and that uh, anti-reflux operations may be uh, indicated in some of these cases. Yeah. Uh, Prof, I've got a question for you. Would you wait two years or less, more? No, that's a little too much for me. I mean, uh, you know, if you cannot uh, deal with a uh, uh, stenosis in, uh, let's say, six or seven dilatations, that means that you are in a, in, in, very stuck. <laughs> Can I make a short comment? Uh... Um, Please one, uh, because here the main problem is the stricture and if the patient is symptomatic and uh, dilatations are not effective or dilatations are required more frequently then there is no point in waiting because it is not related to time frame it is related to symptoms and if the patient is symptomatic the stricture is tight then first thing is it needs revision uh, 
resection and anastomosis. At the same time, uh, anti-reflux procedure should be added. So both the things are concomitant. But yes, if the stricture is dilatable, then uh, can be managed with anti-reflux therapy. And if uh, the duration um, of the dilatation can be increased, then continue with it. It might take six months, eight months, doesn't matter. But yes, if the duration is decreasing, uh, the patient becomes more symptomatic, then there is an indication to go ahead for resection of the stricture and anastomosis. Therapy. And then at that time, we use two therapies, either steroid injections at, just before the dilatation, uh, triamcinolone locally, endoscopically at that time. It makes the dilatation a little more pliable. That's one. And my colleague has been using mitomycin uh, with the use of the plazets after dilatation to prevent next stricture formation a little less. So both these things are considered effective, but I have been using alone locally. Thank you, Prof, both of you. I think we can move to the fourth questions. Well, before we've got a question from uh, uh, Catania, how many dilatation do you suggest before considering stenosis as suitable for surgery? Well, I kind of answer already. I don't think that there is a not, there is not a, a number, but uh, uh, you know, it, uh, after a few of them, you can perceive that the, the time that the patients remain without symptoms and they start again, if this is constant, that means that you are not going to advance with more dilatation. So I don't know how many, but uh, let's say that after one year of treating patients like that, for me, that we will be enough. Yeah. And also a uh, short comment that if there is a proximate dilatation of the esophagus above the stricture, then it is a surgical case. One should not depend on uh, dilatations or anything else. Straightforward, go ahead for resection. If there is already dilatation of the upper pulp. That's important. Thank you so much. We can move to the fourth questions of today's question time. What is the correct management for gastroesophageal reflux after esophageal atresia repair? PPI in all esophageal tissue patients only in the first year of life, PPI, PH, and biopsies in, in symptomatic patients, front duplication should be performed in all symptomatic patients, routine endoscopy with esophageal biopsies in asymptomatic patients. In this case, probably we've got one answer more correct than the others. Let's see. Oh, I was wrong. Uh, Forty one percent. PPI in uh, uh, within one year, 30% PPI, pH impedance monitoring and biopsy in symptomatic, and 30% endoscopy with esophageal biopsies in asymptomatic patients. I think Edu could uh, give us a comment since uh, he is the author of this uh, scenario that has created quite a bit of uh, uncertainty in, amongst uh, our audience. I'm sorry, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, so um, maybe the my I think might depend on what is the um, follow up in in different senses. For instance, we we normally give uh, PPI acid suppression in all patients for the first year at least, and then monitor them with both with uh, pH impedance monitoring and uh, routine endoscopy. So I guess there might be more than one. Um, exact correct answer and what is sure is that we all know that esophageal atresia patients should be um, treated for reflux during the first year 
and then the the follow up is then um, tailored on the sensor and the capabilities we they have I guess. Well, clearly, uh, Edu, Valeria, and Gabriela have uh, created this scenario, uh, looking at the uh, ASPGAN, NASPGAN, uh, CDH Consortium, and Ernica Consensus Conference, uh, not just on their experience or their school's experience. So basically, I think the answers are all reasonable. Any comment from the audience? Okay, so I think we've done for this morning's question time. I'm not sure if Prof Lima wants to give us a break for lunch or we can go on with the program. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, now we finish is the first question time is the last question. And if uh, uh, Giovanna and Olger and President and Bianchi agree, we stop it for the lunch break and restart 2 p.m. o'clock. Is okay for you? Perfect. <laughs> Is okay. Thank you very much to everyone. Okay. I see you later. Thanks to you, you, thanks to you Giovanna and Mario, for moderating this so fine. Okay. In the afternoon, you are the discussant, the principal discussant, Olga. Okay, um, with uh, you. two p.m. o'clock we start. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Maria. See you. See you later. Bye, bye, Devendra. Bye. bye. Thank you very bye, much. Devendra. Bye, Devendra. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Joanna.